Okay, so, so let me go back. Okay, all right, so this is not going to work. So, um, so, so why should we discuss this specifically in surgical departments? The second chunk is how is the graduate structure of the Brazilian education system? So how is the national graduate system, what we call in Portuguese the Sistema Nacional de Pós-Graduação, right? So how is that organized? And then with those two pieces of information in mind, which are pieces of information that contribute to the understanding of excellence, I think we can go on to defining what is excellence in the context of graduate education, okay? Um, so to start off, a few years back, I gave this talk at our Department of Urology because this article had just come out and it, it ended up being uh, mentioned in a nature um, review, uh, in a nature editorial, they decided to discuss this. Is, um, what are the challenges and ideas for the future for scholarship in academic surgery? And in this case, they were very focused on basic science in, um, in surgical departments. But I think we should bear in mind that basic science is a bridge towards our graduate education that we are looking for. Now, when we think about how everything started, they go back all the way to um, Sir William Osler, who created the concept of even medical residency back in the day, what he called was a triple threat, which is very much the Humboldtian view that we have on education, right? It was a, uh, a person that could aggregate within his activity, research activities, uh, uh, physician activities, and to also be a professor. Um, he also created the concept of medical residency. I think everyone here sort of knows a little bit about this part of history. But in the hundred years that followed his actions, um, there were many Nobel Prizes that ended up coming out of surgical departments. Um, and I think we sort of consolidated the you know, bench to bedside concept, so the translational translation of research findings into guidelines and clinical applications, et cetera. And then in 1990, um, Ernest Boyer, when he published his scholarship, Revisited, um, basically divided, divided this into, if I, I think I, eu posso vir para esse lado? Consegue me ver aqui? Pode. But I think I'm going to stay on this side, it's easier. So, four um, domains of academic activity, discovery, integration, application, and teaching. And these four domains are what he considered in his um, publication to be important in me medical formation, right? So discovery, basic research, no need for application, but then integration, and then application, because that's how we bring from basic to, to clinical, and also teaching. <laughs> this was important this was so important that, that for example, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, ACGME, they recommend assessing these four um, domains as integrated domains, okay? Um, now, when we look at how this has evolved and how this has impacted, um, has been impacted recently by medical activity, the outlook is not as, a, a, as good as it used to be in terms of research in surgical departments. Because there is, and this is something we were just talking about a little bit earlier, there is difficulty in maintaining high quality research, um, basic research in surgical departments because of other activities, teaching, administration, preceptor activities, medical activities. Um, so there has been a progressive decrease in surgical participation in basic research. This has been observed in many different aspects. So there has been decreased NIH funding. So um, while in general there has been more than double um, uh, an increase in the number of NIH proposals submitted, in surgical departments this has been much lower. And the same is true for funding. So when they asked what, in, in top 25 institutions, right, what were the main, um, uh, the main challenges in advancing this type of basic research, what they found was that, so they collected data from 25 main institutions, 
Um, and they sort of divided into people who were more experienced and people who were less experienced. Um, and also division chiefs and chairmen. What they observed was a decrease in funding um, in surgical departments, research funding, um, a decrease in surgery when compared to clinical or to internal medicine departments. So even competitively, it's decreasing. And a de decrease in basic science when compared to other areas, abstract submitted to um, the American Society of uh, American Surgical Society, Surgical Congress, right? So, and when they ask people, is it realistic to, to expect this from surgeons, they found that more often people said that, no, it's, it's not realistic to expect them to be proficient in, in basic research. Why? Mostly because of time, but also because of support. And what consumes most time are clinical activities, but also administrative duties. So this is sort of what's going on. This is the general outlook of what we are trying to deal with while we are trying to improve our graduation, right? Um, I'm just going to skip by these. This is not as important. So basically, um, what we are seeing is a change in formation because 75 of current department heads in surgical departments um, have or did have training in, in basic research. But now, only 53% of current residents at the time of this publication did. So there has been a decrease in that. There's also, there have been changes in the, the academic hospital with an increased um, load of administrative activities. Um, and this has impacted current training. So um, it is relevant to say that even in departments that have a lot of funding, two-thirds of um, professors feel that uh, basic research should only be taught to those that are apt or to those that demonstrate an aptitude towards that. But the editorial, the Nature editorial, they try to discuss that this, we should fight against this exodus because um, there are areas where s departments of surgery are the sole contributors or the main contributors, but also because it is important to create in the, the surgeons that we are graduating a scientific mindset, right? Or an understanding even. So the main suggestions that they have are that you know, academic medicine needs to better relate with its stakeholders and stakeholders, the public, the students, um, the patients, physi other physicians, politicians. We need to better situate our graduate programs and our departments within this setting. And that's very important when we consider graduate evaluation here in Brazil. Um, there's a need for professional administration in these departments. And that's a challenge in public, um, at public institutions in Brazil. How do we maintain professional administration in public institutions? Um, Departments need to have in mind that while people will be very specialized, the department itself has a role in integrating this towards being fully integrated, right? Um, and basic science needs to be well connected with clinical application. This is something that we've been very um, mindful of in our department. So this is kind of what we do at our infertility research group down in Sao Paulo, up in Sao Paulo. In, at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. We have here on the right side um, a clinical platform where we do all the analyses. And we started off as a clinical group, right? Clinical slash surgical group doing um, basically for patients with infertility. But then on top of this, we started developing our basic science platform. So cellular studies and molecular studies. This was all created using as a basis having a strong clinical department. So uh, this is very true for groups that are usually very clinical, clinically oriented or medically oriented, that it's on top of that that you're able to create a research. You, you need a strong clinical foundation to be able to, to build upon. So that's where you need to start off. So that's just a very, very long preamble, if you will, about um, why we need to discuss this in surgical formation. But now 
when we look at how the graduate um, system is organized in Brazil, basically our national graduate system is divided into areas of knowledge, 49 areas of knowledge. Um, it is very reliant on peer review, so there's a lot of peer review in assessment of graduate programs, assessment both for creating graduate programs and for continuity of graduate programs. They try to create as much as possible specific metrics. I know this is at a time where we are having problems with our evaluation being questioned in the justice and everything, but um, they are reliant on specific metrics and they have a unified platform for data collection so that everyone submits in the same platform. And this is basically how Brazil is divided. So we have colleges, each college is divided into greater areas, and each greater area is divided into the specific areas. We have three colleges in Brazil, life sciences, exact, technological, and multidisciplinary um, sciences, and humanities. And each one of these is then subdivided. I, this is in Portuguese because this is from our uh, Ministry of Health website. Um, it was in Portuguese. But this is just to show that each college is then um, subdivided into greater areas and then to specific areas. So for example, this graduate program right here is in Medicine 3 on the left side, right side, right side for you guys, yeah. Um, which is under health sciences, okay? Um, so this follows a very, you know, I would say paradigmatic approach of how knowledge is divided, right? Or, um, and this is, assessment is important because this assessment is basically what we need to look at when we want to think about how to achieve excellence in a graduate program, right? So there are ad hoc consultants that work with the Ministry of Health with the Campus Foundation to try to assess the graduate program. And, and the assessment is very, um, it, the purpose is not only to penalize or to give a good or a bad score. The purpose is to really you know, state you're on the right way. You're, this, is, this is good. This is not as good. You're not really focused on your students. You're focused on, for example, publications, which is okay but it's not the most important, et cetera, right? And this is what they are going to try to ask. So how is the program planning itself? Strategic planning in graduate programs is very important because as I said previously, the graduate program and the department needs to integrate with society, needs to integrate with politics, with politicians, with decision making. We need to integrate our programs with a our public health system here in Brazil, for example, right? We need to know what our patients are looking for, what, what, where the problems are. We need to connect to society, right? But we all, also, we have to keep in mind that the most important activity is graduating people. So we are formative. That's our top priority. We are an academic uh, we are in an academic area and we need to um, concern ourselves with the academics. To make that happen, we will have, obviously, to plan and to you know, garner or to bring in um, uh, funds for infrastructure, for financing research. We need to align our program with institutional alignment. So for federal universities, for example, we need to get, guarantee that our graduate programs is, is aligned with the institutional planning, which is um, published every five years. So there's a, a lot of alignment that is necessary. And then all these other questions are questions that impact, obviously, in this question number one, which is so central. So how good is our clinical, is our faculty? How good are, is our faculty in teaching? How good are they in terms of international presence or as national, in national leadership? What about our students? Are, are we helping our students achieve excellence? Are they, are they nucleating? Are they forming other groups? Are they f traveling internationally? Are they publishing? Are they becoming leaders, right? And then, how much is this graduate program producing in terms of articles? How, how good are these articles? 
And how good are these articles is a very difficult question to answer. It's standardized, but I think that the way that it's answered is not the best way. But it's, maybe it's the possible way. Um, and then um, a, a question that was introduced a couple evaluation cycles ago, which is how does the program connect to society? So again, this is my view on what we need to think about when we're thinking about excellence. But it's not a formula, right? We know, because if it were, everything would be excellent and then nothing would be excellent. So it's very difficult to, <laughs> to, for me to say, okay, this, just follow these guidelines and it'll work out, okay? But this is a little bit of, about what I think. We need to focus on some specific areas, right? How is the program structured? to achieve its formative activities. That's number one. That's very important, that's central. That's the essence of what a graduate program exists for. Second, how well are our students graduating? And third, how does the program connect to society? And I use as sort of like a poetic license, I like to say that we should follow advice from three literary, um, from three books that were published, from Thomas Kuhn, uh, Dostoevsky, and Max Weber, and I'll explain. So, <laughs> when we try to answer how does the program structure itself for its formative activities, what are we looking at? We are looking, obviously, at infrastructure. So, do you have labs? Do you have clinics? But clinics for formative activities, for the masters and doctorate. So, not clinics to teach surgery itself. That's important, but not in the graduate program context. In the graduate program, pro, graduate program context is how are we using these clinics to do research and to um, in, in our uh, students a scientific mindset support is important, so courses, libraries, but I don't need to say this at Urgis or to concern too much at, at Unifepi, but this is important um, depending on regional regions. So, number two is the academic proposal. So this is something that we just, which is what the classes that we're, why are we planning those classes? So my students to learn, for example, all reproduction. Of course, I want them to learn reproduction, of reproduction, whatever. But if we are putting that in a graduate context, in the scientific context, um, how, how do we bring that? Are we using seminars? Are we planning these academic activities? Are we discussing philosophy of science, which is something that I'm very excited about discussing in my program. So how are we trying to bring that all in? Um, what are the proficiencies that we require? Proficiencies is w with one F, but what are the proficiencies that we require for our students? Um, and what do we expect them to have when they're leaving? So w what change are we trying to bring to their professions, right? What is the faculty presence, financing, and what is the planning and future outlook? So this is where I like to cite Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions because he talked a lot about how science is paradigmatic and this is the essence of a graduate program is to structure itself around paradigmatic areas, right? We need to have focus if we look. And that's, that's a challenge for you guys because the Department of Surgery is huge as a department, as a clinical department in clinical activities, has many different areas. So how do we solve the challenge of being good at urology and heart surgery or cardiology or uh, neurology, et cetera, and also being able to provide a paradigmatic scientific formation to your students? That's something that you need to discuss internally, right? now. The whole program is therefore structured around this hierarchy. So we start off with an area of concentration, a concentration area, however you want to call it. 
these are divided into research lines and these are subdivided into research projects. The research projects are the, research, the professor's research lines. But the research line is something that the graduate program itself does. Everything needs to revolve around this. So when we think about infrastructure, how do labs serve our areas of concentration? How do labs um, feed into our research lines for the graduate program? How does funding do that? We say we are good at this, but are we getting funding on this? Are we publishing? Are our students acting in these research lines? This is what we want to look at. We don't want a program that is only publishing without the students, or that is publishing a lot, but, but it's not actually giving classes to students, or that is giving classes but is not organized in specific research lines. I'm spending a little bit of time here because I know this was an issue in the 2017 evaluation for this program, so, yeah. How do we maximize use of our core facilities for this structure? That's important, right? This is specifically important when we think about, you know, our academic proposal. So how do we build our classes and everything around this? How do we engage our students in this area of concentration, research line, research project proposal? How do we bring them into funding? How do they participate in funding and co-advising, et cetera? So, okay, so I already said that. The second point is, how well are our students graduating? Obviously, we can look at publications to see what they're publishing. Remembering that publication is an externality of our formative activity. It's not, the, it's not what we want. We want them to learn. But we see if they're learning a lot by how they are publishing. That's one way of looking at it, right? Another way is how much are we able to send them abroad? Students, they represent the program internationally. Whenever we send a student somewhere, they are there representing our program. So, our, the graduate program, they're representing our institution. They are building bridges with international groups. Students do that a lot. So, um, this is something that is also very important. Also, a, a second possible externality would be technical production. So patents, innovation, medical guidelines, manuals. This is not something that is particularly important in academic programs. It's more important in professional programs as we divide them in Brazil. I'm not a big fan of dividing into academic and professional because I think that they both fall under academic anyway. But this is something that we can do and that brings value to the formative experience and it brings value to the students, right? Nucleation is something that we're always going to look at. So when we look at other areas in Brazil and outside of Brazil, do we have people that studied in the program? Do we have alumni that are forming new groups, forming new, new, new leaderships, et cetera? Um, we are very concerned at our program in teaching our students about the functioning of the uh, of education in Brazil. So how, the National Plan of Education, the National Graduate Plan, the National Graduate System, just so our students know how they are able to, what they will they'll expect when they graduate. So this is also important, and I like citing. Um, Dostoevsky's Karamazov because it's a story about a famous parasite, right? So we need to form parasite. We need to form people that will take our places, that will kill us, right? We all want to die, right? Anyway, so <laughs> to, to form people that will be able to proficiently take our pace. And it's, you know, I know it's a little bit of a joke, but it's very often that we see groups that have very strong leaderships that end when the leader retires or leaves. There's like a vacuum of power. So what we need to do is to avoid that, to be able to form people that will take our places. Hopefully respectfully, right? Uh, the third point is, how does the program connect to society? So are we able to bring um, scientific formation to our elementary and to our middle um, schools? Are we able to involve them? It's a big challenge for a surgical program 
but it's not, it's not impossible. We had students from middle schools come into our labs to learn, to see what it's like to work in to, w the day-to-day -day of a lab. So I think that's important because it sort of creates that the, the scientific curiosity or fosters the scientific curiosity, right? How are we demonstrating what we do? Visibility is very difficult to discuss these days because copies thinks that websites are enough and I'm, that's very disconnected from very young generations where social media takes up a, a huge a lot a huge place much more so than websites right but visibility is important right um, how is the program contributing to to expanding other graduate programs how is it connected to our public health system? That, those are ways that graduate programs in medical sciences can contribute, right? And what benefits are they bringing to help organize civil society? So in the US, we have, there are many different patient advocacy, advocacy groups that work together with funding agencies, et cetera. We have a little bit of that starting to show up in Brazil. I would say that maybe Serra Pileira Institute has some initiatives that would fall under, not specifically patient advocacy group, but they are trying to work in specialized areas, such as um, scientific information for the public, for example. And then I always like to say, cite Max Weber because in his um, Protestant ethics and uh, uh, I forget the name of the book, but anyway, he says that what they did back then was, what Germany did back then was to open the doors of the, what, what Protestantism did in Germany was to open the doors of the monastery, and that's what we dream about doing with our universities, is to being able to exchange information with the public more freely, and it's a big challenge. So this is just one very short example of one metric this is in 2017 for the 2013 to 2016 um, period, publications in the surgical areas. And we see that there were almost 7,000 articles and classified as 46% was were classified as A1, A2, or B1, which then were the three top tiers, right? But when we look at how this was with students, there's a drop from 46 to 42%, but there's a drop in half and the number of articles. So it's not a problem to publish without students, but we need to, as much as possible, bring students in on publications so they can participate and they can learn from that. That's my email if you have any questions, and thank you very much for your, your attention and everything. Thank you, Ricardo, for being on time, and sorry to... <laughs> So uh, we're going to keep going. Um, I would like to invite uh, Professor Flavio Fuchs to talk us about consolidating excellence in postgraduate courses. Uh, professor <coughs> Flavio is a full professor in cardiology. He has a full professorship in medicine, cardiology, by uh, Fundação Federal de Ciências Médicas de Porto Alegre, postdoctorate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, visiting professor at John Hopkins University, and sabbatical in cardiology in Brigham, Harvard, uh, 2013. He was one of the coordinators of the INCT for Health Technology Assessments and uh, the uh, Prever Study, National Research Council, CNPq, scholarship holder, level 1A. And uh, he is uh, the main professor from my uh, <coughs> from uh, the, the, our uh, graduate uh, at medical school. So this is probably one of my uh, best uh, things that I can say to you. You were an example for us, and again, you continue to be an example, so thank you, Professor. Let's hear from you. Thank you, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's quite wonderful to, to come to an activity like, like this one and start listening to this, uh, this kind of manifestation. Thank you for inviting me, thank you for being here. Uh, I hope to help you in the development of the seminar with the goals of to, to improve uh, the performance of the, uh, the postgraduate program in surgery, okay? I decided to, well, wh why am, am I here? Uh, because I, I used to, 
uh, to meet, to, to find, to talk a little bit with Dr. Ricardo Savares in the emergency department of our hospital. No? And was looking for a dinosaur no? to tell something about the history of uh, graduate programs in our school. No? And he met me, and that's all. This, he was the guy, okay? Uh, but I would like to thank for this invitation because I had the opportunity to to update my view about this this subject. As uh, I'm a very very old guy, I've been in any in many places talking about this and talking about that and so on. Well, I decide to to, to tell a little bit about the history of our graduate programs in our school. But uh, previous of that, to to, to uh, as a, a witness of the history, nah? tell something about that you. I'm sure that nobody knows here, even our invited uh, speakers from abroad, um, that I'm trying to show here. Let me pick up the, the device to, to go on. Usually I used to press the wrong place, but uh, I think that uh, Pioneering Medical and Biological Research in Brazil, okay? Um, I'll, how everything started in a way that was systematized, or organized, the best word, uh, to create the programs and the, uh, the uh, of graduate programs and the training of scientists in Brazil. Before that, uh, pro science existed in Brazil uh, and were famous by the guy who reported or described the, uh, the Chagas disease and so on. But there was not uh, a career in the university to, to, to become a scientist, okay? And the guys that started all of, them, uh, all of this, uh, one of them is this guy, is Roche Silva. Um, uh, the name of Roche Silva, who discovered the bradykinin, bradykinin, okay? Uh, the discovery of bradykinin, uh, 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 put uh, Roche Silva as one of the indicates for the Nobel Prize at the beginning of the 50s, okay? Uh, the history tells that he was one among two that was uh, chosen at that time. The Brazilian, this is probably the best performance of a scientist in Brazil to be the number two. We do not have any number one in any area, even in literature and sports and so on. Well, there is no Nobel Prize for sports. Um, and here you, you see what I'm telling about, that's a, a biological essay, okay? A biological essay, something that's not used today, but at that time, provide, I'm not explain the figures, but provide to identify the activity of bradykinin or bradykinin that in the, in the model, experimental model with a, a venom or uh, a snake, okay? that uh, liberated this kind of product. Uh, let me show you to my friends here in, Brazil, in Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, in our university, close to here, when there is not a clinical hospital. There are people starting working on applied uh, research in patients. Uh, everybody, the, the oldest guy, the older guy here knows uh, Faraco, and Flavio Freitas uh, and Desi Azevedo, their former cardiology, they injected bradykinin in patients, uh, putting before a, a catheter on the right side and the left side of the heart, pacing by the head atrium. It's very complicated here in the Santa Casa, the whole uh, house, our philanthropic hospital here. And they identified the, the effects of bradykinin in, in, in humans. By the first time. Uh, there, uh, thereafter, in uh, Rossi Silva and other, other professors, he started the university, the, the advanced campus of the University of Sao Paulo in the Ribeirão Preto. A group of, uh, of professors that were not happy living in Sao Paulo, uh, questions of power, they get together to start a new uh, university. And they had a very good spectacular success at, at that time, okay? And this is one of the students of Rocha e Silva who identified another effect of these uh, uh, products that were, were present in the uh, snake uh, venom, uh, that's Sergio Ferreira. Huh? 
show that there was a, something that uh, increased, potentiated the, the bradykinin uh, activity in a model of uh, Ilius, uh, experimental model of uh, uh, Ilius in, in, the, in the lab. Well, this is the most important scientific discovery in biological science in Brazil. Very old. We are not discovering anybody, any else more, okay? Because this uh, was thereafter tested in individual, in human beings. The venom was injected in human beings to identify the effects of the venom, to, uh, to antagonize the effect of, of uh, overactivity of renin-angiotensin system. No? That guy was graduated here, here, at, at that building close to us, no? uh, the, uh, the same, uh, the same uh, time as uh, we, a guy that you know very much, no? Prof Professor, uh, um, well, I forgot the name now, it's so, so important, but he was the speaker of the term, of, the, of the, uh, their uh, colleagues, Dr. Eduardo Krieger. He was somewhat, uh, uh, advisor of my activities. I was provocated by him when he came to Porto Alegre to give a discipline of physiology and he presented, uh, he brought his own papers. I, at that time, I was giving classes of pharmacology. I, I, I believed that uh, there was another world uh, reading just in the Goodman and Gilman book. Well, this is not for us. No, this is Brazilian needs to, uh, to know how to read a book. It would be impossible to publish something that were, wouldn't be cited in the Goodman Gilman. I'm very happy today because I have two, ten, three, four, five manuscripts cited in the, in the Goodman Gilman. Okay? It's, it was possible. And uh, Eduardo Krieger, Krieger, Krieger uh, thought me that. Well, and the uh, discovery of, uh, uh, of these people. No, together was Capote. This is a very, very big success in terms of drug treatment of hypertension and other things in the 70s and 80s of the last century, okay? And the Squib, the pharmaceutical industry, was uh, working together with the people of Ribeirão Preto, okay? They took the molecule and <laughs> uh, uh, take it to the U.S., and they transformed the, the venom, the BPF-9, that was uh, not good to not be administered to patients in the Captopril, okay? There's a new line of drugs and so on that we are still using today. Well, uh, just uh, thank you, thank you very much, Pro Professor Bertola, because you, were, you had the same, uh, were, uh, in, in some way, uh, uh, a continuous of your presentation. Uh, I appreciate very much when you refer the, that uh, uh, relationship between science and the literature. I do like to do that very much as well. Uh, very, very good speech. Congratulations. The beginning of the graduate programs in Brazil was um, done by those guys that are cited in the, in the slide. Uh, Sucupira, Newton Sucupira, this famous Sucupira report. But uh, in the group was Rocha e Silva, uh, the guy that I cited before, uh, and a, a, a professor of mine, okay, that the, the young guys here did not meet, but I met and I learned somewhat with him, the professor Rubens Marcel, from the Santa Casa here in Porto Alegre, Famous, uh, one of the leaders of our professors at that time as a cardiology professor. Well, this, uh, this report proposes the definition of master and doctorate degrees in Brazil, okay? separating them from specialization and course. Okay? I stress and recall our graduate programs use this word, graduate programs, okay? even manuscripts when submitted abroad. Uh, propose the base for preparation of professor for and graduate schools. And the most important thing that they decide to do, I think that these guys had the, inf the influence of uh, Rocha e Silva, okay, to propose that the professor, no? the training of professor for universities, for 
uh, schools of medicine should be based on training on science, to become a scientist, okay? This was very difficult at that time. We are not used to do this, okay, in our training, and MD and in the medical residence. Huh? They disconsider it, this kind of uh, uh, graduate prog uh, formation, okay? Where at that time, nor still are, pissed off this, this decision, okay? Our 10 years of training huh, does not give a, 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 a certificate, okay, of doctor. We are just medical doctors that here in Brazil doesn't have the same meaning as an MD in the US and the other countries. Well, the proposal worked out. Now, this is just an overview about the success of the organization, the, the proposing of to create programs like this one, okay? The number of doctors, the number of master uh, uh, degrees conferred to people in Brazil increased in an exponential way, as you are seeing. Uh, many things could be said about uh, the success of to measure the results of this initiative. I've, I, I've chosen one of them. Uh, here is, excuse me, I, I was wrong, going to the wrong place, despite to, ah, excuse me. This slide. Uh, the, the amount of uh, money that is is currently applied to investigation, to research in Brazil. There's a large amount of money, okay? Uh, you should remind that uh, this 50s, uh, uh, in the 50s of the last centuries, there is just the, the, the money from uh, schools of meds or, or universities, a very small amount of money. The people do, did not have a mo uh, uh, fundings to do research. And now we do have 6.2, Billions, billions of dollars, okay? And the sum, an estimate of the sum of the different fountains of funding of research in Brazil. This is a good money, okay? We need to be prepared to look for this money mm -hmm. for our research. In the US, it's at about 20 times uh, higher huh? uh, the amount from public, but in the United States there's another problem. Right? We cannot measure the amount of this applied by private investigation. Uh, the, the, the research is not more anymore in the just universities. It's outside university. Huh? And are using many things here that were done outside university, okay? Let me check the time of my presentation here, okay? And the device that would not be Discover in Brazil, and even discover in the university, in every university in anywhere in the world, okay? This is a result of the, the a guy who left the university, huh? Steve Jobs, huh? he decided to, uh, to work in a garage, okay? Uh, nothing thinking about the university. He did not need uh, uh, any support or studies in universities, okay? Bench clinical epidemiological and applied research. This is a base what of what are you thinking to do up here in the, the now our colleagues from the surgery uh, graduate program, okay? What kind of research are we going to do, okay? Where I can find uh, the results, the, the publications and so on. Well, to remind that the bench research changed our lives. I, I, I put here a, a small list of, uh, uh, discoveries that change our lives. Huh? I do like very much to talk about the uh, psych uh, psychosis, okay? The discover uh, chlorpromazine, chlorpromazine, or chlorpromazine. I don't know how to say in English. The first time that I've said this word in English, okay? But uh, in 90, in the 50s of the last century, we had a hospital with 4,000 patients huh? uh, with mental diseases, huh? Uh, almost in a jail for people with mental disease. The San Pedro Hospital and Chlorpromazine closed that hospital. 
Now it is really closed, okay? And there is uh, just a small number of uh, patients uh, institutionalized in Brazil because of mental disease, okay? And this was a, a drug. It's fantastic, this drug. Wow, it, it was discovered, né? tested in patients, and changed fully the scenario. The others, everybody knows. I put something about the surgeons here, né? where they are hearts and prots and so on. Uh, best, uh, but the, the, the problem with the bench, uh, we are facing problems with the bench research, okay? This uh, look for citations, look for publications, and the citations I publish on one paper and everybody cites it, okay? Creates the index, the age index, huh? that measures uh, how we are being efficient to do science. This is a biased estimate, strongly biased estimate, because it was fooled by basic research. Everything that our advances are coming from there, but let me show you that the... This is one paper, one among 31 papers on stem cell effects, treatments, these in patients that were retracted from the literature. Huh? He, the investigator was from uh, Brigham, Harvard. He published so many papers in many, uh, the, the name of the guy is this one, is, he, he is 84 years old now, he's retired, okay? He does not give interviews about what happened, but he's not in the jail where he should be, because 31 papers that have a strong influence in terms of uh, investment of, in research and the expectation of patients about stem cells. Well, there is a still research in this area, but was not the uh, silver bullet, okay? Yeah, surely it's not the silver bullet. At least in cardiology. This I'm sure about that. 17 were attracted for big journals, Lancet, New England. Brigham agreed to pay back $10 million to NIH as refunding, okay? For the investment done in wrong or uh, fraud huh? investigation. Uh, NIH spent it, despite of that, after 2000. 13, NIH still funded almost an half million, uh, billion dollars in stem cell research. The Americans are discussing this. I think that Dr. Mo can talk a little bit about this uh, or co comment this. Uh. And uh, this is the problem of the, the bench research. When the, when the mice mislead, uh, the economics of studies that cannot be reproduced. No? Uh, the, estimate of the, the current estimate is more than 50%. I think that's about 90%, my view, because I had experience at the bench. And the experiment in the beach needs to be uh, efficient. The experiment needs to show what the investigator is thinking about the problem. I was a small trainer of that, and then I, I ran away from that uh, environment, because you run the model. It didn't work. Run again. It didn't work. It ran again. Didn't work. Run again. Well, now it's, uh, it happens what I'm waiting. And then the results were published. And then the people tried to reproduce this in order to study it. They could not do that. What happened? They just, just leave that aside. They would take care of other things. I do have, uh, despite this is not a problem of uh, wrongdoings, as that deck inverser, okay? But the scientists of the bench themselves, okay, they do not have, the, they do not take care of this problem. E even uh, uh, despite to have now a, a spectacular recommendation to do basic research ag according to the rules, to the methods of the clinical research, to define an hypothesis, to calculate this, the, the sample size, huh? and so on. 
They used to take 10 rats on one side, 10 rats on the other side, and test uh, 10, 20 uh, outcomes. Then one was positive, then published the results, and so on. There is still here, there is evaluations about the, the application, the arrived guidelines. I do recommend very much for, for anybody who will try to start to work in bench research to follow this. In the hospital here of clinics, the people are doing this. I'm very happy knowing that the people which are in the bench are calculating sample size and so on. And, but the clinical trials really uh, um, change the way that we think about medicine, our patients, and the, the disease, and so on. This is what is spectacular. Uh, I have a contribution to study this. this. is a very, very old professor of clinical pharmacology, as was uh, said before, no? with my books, so on, and I would like to, intro, to, to show to those who don't, does, uh, who don't know Lenito Anmacher, my dear friend, who is my associated uh, publisher of these papers in most of them. I had the opportunity to publish this uh, honor, this uh, tribute to the 50th anniversary of randomized clinical trial with colleagues in the United States, okay? And they showed that the, the, how these studies changed fully the way that we think about our, the effectiveness of our interventions. Okay, we usually do, we believed in the past that uh, treat a patient with a drug or a surgery and the patient getting better, that was an experiment, okay? Uh, and usually the patients that submit to drugs or surgeries, they used to, despite to having pain in the, no? in the PO, uh, they said, how are you feeling? Ah, much better, okay? okay. The, the, they do believe that. And at clinical trials, I brought just one of them. It's very important. The streptomycin in patients with tuberculosis in both lungs, okay, that could not be treated with the treatments of that time. No? They were tested the effect of streptomycin, okay? And you see that there was a reduction of almost 50% in the death rate in six months. No? This changed the way that we think about medicine. This was the first uh, randomized clinical trial published in British Medical Journal in 1948. Huh? And Bradford Hill, famous by, their, uh, by his contributions to science, uh, that uh, uh, gave the table with the random numbers to create similar groups of exposition to the control group and the treatment drug. And looking, uh, returning to the question of uh, the stem cell no? therapies, uh, bench research would not show that it did not work, okay? Because the people are publishing, 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 publish. When they decide to do clinical trials, as this one, in patients, many clinical trials, no? as you are seeing, uh, the outcome is the left ventricular and diastolic volume, okay? And the difference was less than two milliliters, okay? In patients submitted to stem cell transplants and controls. It's the end. That kind of stem cell doesn't work in the heart, okay? Clinical science, randomized clinical trials, improving the quality of science, strongly. Well, the objective is to graduate doctors in Brazil. Uh, uh, this is a, a thinking, my thinking, but I share these ideas with some colleagues in my department, my division, friends, and so on. To find tal talents, no? the, the guys that don't need any kind of graduate program, okay? To change our lives, no? the genius, okay? Steve Jobs, for instance, okay? They do not need to be in a graduate program to discover what they did. Uh, to prepare scientists will improve the care of ourselves and, selves and patients, okay? This is a second reasonable goal, okay? For many who are involved in this, no? to discover things in this area. To prepare better professionals will be able to interpret the literature. This is very important too, okay? 
to have a critical view about what has been published. The estimates that more than 90% does not serve for anything is very, very, very true. Okay? Not because they are uh, a fraud. No, because it doesn't matter if you read or not read that paper. Okay? Doesn't change our life. And finally, to prepare professors will teach the above steps to beginners. No? Uh, we are frequently <laughs> in several areas, mostly in the social areas and so on, preparing professors to, to teach others to be professors. Okay? But to touch in real world uh, this difference in soft and hard science should be recognized and should be treated differently. It's not possible to admit that physics and engineering and medicine should, be, should have the same grants and same salaries and so on, as the people who just give speeches okay, about what you should do. Graduate program our school, uh, several steps. So I think that I used uh, almost 20, 23 minutes of my time. Uh, to the younger guys here, no? to, to know that everything started uh, with the creation of four programs. First evaluation, A for all. They met in Brasilia, the coordinators of the programs. Well, what do you think? What's my program? It's excellent. A. No? And you what? You are A2. A2, A2, A for everybody. Okay? Every course. But then the scientists start working and then required quality and volume of scientific evaluation, uh, production to give the, the grades for the programs. Uh, this happened in 1981. I'm not absolutely sure about that. I did not find it in, in the Google. But it was around this. All programs that were evaluated according to this new paradigm got three, three, uh, the, the grades goes from one to five, less than three is not authorized, no? uh, and six and seven for different kinds of excellence, okay? Uh, a, a special moment in our, the history of our school was the creation of the clinical science uh, program, medical science program, okay? With George Gross, no? our former professor, deceased, and professor that came from the United States, one of them Americans, Bruce Duncan, his wife, Marina Schmidt, several others, okay? I was among the several others, my wife as well, Sarah Sander Fuchs and others, okay? We start to talk about evidence-based medicine. We had training with uh, Fletcher, huh? Susan Fletcher and Robert Fletcher, a couple in Chapel Hill. I met them, I assisted some conference of them, and my wife we had a formal course of uh, evidence-based medicine. The book came to, to our, uh, our school, everybody started reading it. And the disciplines of clinical epidemiology, applied statistics, and then the development, development of research in, in, in epidemiological and clinical models, in randomized clinical trials, starts to, to happen in our university, in our school. Okay? And this is, uh, I think, that is a kind of vocation that we do have here to do this kind of investigation. Our programs and the grades, uh, we, do have, we do have a seven uh, psychiatry program, okay? Our program there where I work, uh, where I do my jobs as an uh, investigator is for uh, cardiology six and others, and surgery is fighting to, to get a better uh, grade and to survive. Uh, yeah, I know that's very difficult in face what we're going to discuss in this seminar. That's very, very welcome, okay? Well, uh, hospital clinics did not exist at that time to start, but see if it was uh, Santa Casa did not happen this. But the hospital the clinic, as you see, that we are doing with uh, uh, um, collaboration, certo? The efforts and the money and so on. Hospital the clinic is, uh, uh, let me say here, it's quite dangerous to say this, but this is linked to the University Federal, our university. But as a own life, thanks God, okay? In terms of uh, the staff and research and money, we should do something better there as well. But university, our university, 
Unfortunately, it's not, uh, in my view, uh, uh, product, um, giving back what the, the amount of money it's put in here. Então, uh, then, 24,000, uh, then, 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 who are in the hospital clinics is much ahead of them, okay? In terms of uh, publications and, and citations and so on. But I, I, I got the brigand, <laughs> no? where I, uh, I spent one year there, uh, 10 years ago, uh, to the program of Web of Science does, does not uh, uh, operate this number of manuscripts and citations. No? I recommend to them that should use a big computer, a bigger computer to do that. No? Everything is possible. No? But it's just 10,000. No? There's the limit to calculate the citation index. But it's probably uh, is at least uh, 200 times higher than our one. Okay? From the brig. Despite to have that manuscript, <laughs> that guy, <laughs> the page research, in the clinical research, that was uh, was doing felonies and not research. Let me talk a little bit about myself. I don't like very much to talk about myself, but uh, anyway, I, I am a medium-sized scientist, okay, uh, in terms of uh, publications. Nothing close to our invited speaker. I look at that. That guy is more than a hundred uh, thousand. Uh, Manuscripts published, cited in uh, Medline. Yeah, that's true, okay? In order that you know what you are talking with, okay? <laughs> uh, by my age index, I, 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 I call myself a medium sized scientist, but I would like to share that I have a theory that starts with my master degree. I'm, uh, this is, I start to show the results of the programs, okay? The opportunity of people to start to that who do have, uh, do like to do research, okay? And then they are provocated to do this. That want to be professor, surgeons in hospital the clinics and so on, huh? uh, get the, the smell, the good smell of science, okay? I had my opportunity at this environment. My first work, was published in the previous slide, line 1986, okay? Uh, I did myself with volunteers, students of medicine, okay? In the outpatient clinics, Zona 18, collecting blood, measuring blood pressure, funding zero, okay? Collaboration, the, the exams are done in the hospital, okay? Because I was friend of the the boss, the chief of the, the lab, that was the time. But this paper was very important for my knowledge. There's 15 citations now, okay? And thereafter, I had the opportunity to go to the United States three times and so on, huh? get funding and, and so on. Well, this is, I'm very happy to have my own theory uh, almost, I think that it is demonstrates that the theory of causation of cardiovascular disease uh, from the result from a high side shift in distribution of blood pressure to humankind was interested in my paper and uh, I do can send it, okay? Uh, it's very important for all of you, okay? It's blood pressure. The normal blood pressure is not under 14 by 90 and not even another 13 by 80. The normal blood pressure of the humankind should be 110 by 60. This is the central point of our theory. My colleague here is the most important uh, clinical investigator in hypertension in the history of medicine, okay? Paul Welton. Yeah, but uh, usually, <laughs> The pupils are better than <laughs> the professor. This is one of them, uh, Otav Berwanger, okay? He's working in Heistein with money from Heistein and uh, the money from the government also as a tax, uh, uh, 
devolution. They do not pay taxes and put the money in research. Né? Five big hospitals in Brazil. And is doing very, very well. This is the last uh, two years and a half. You see, I put just, uh, don't put uh, the, the slide would not have space for everything important that is done in the last two years, okay? This is just Lancet, JAMA, and New England. That guy was in my uh, outpatient hypertension clinic for three years. He was my student of uh, pharmacology in another school year. And he said, he says in conference about his history, a very young guy, I do have three advisors. One of them is me. I'm very happy with that. Okay? Bruce Duncan is the other. And then I can use Otávio Bervanger as an example of a, a guy who uh, was added space uh, to the place to do his, uh, his PhD, né? his doctoral degree here uh, in our school. Okay? Thereafter, he went to Sao Paulo and everything. Uh, it would be surely a guy that would not be, not be to be a doctor, okay? But being a doctor was easier for him. And finding, uh, and finally, perspectives. Let me provoke you for the, the debate, okay? What I'm going to do now, not pointing to surgery, because you presented né, the limitations, the problems, what we should do. But this thing may be interested, uh, of interest of everybody in any area. Okay? What are we going to do to keep the training of scientists in Brazil? Okay? Well, one, one thing is to, to improve the international collaboration. Okay? Uh, we do have strong international collaborations, our group, many papers here. This year is the NCD risk factor collaboration. The sum of the papers we where I am an author, okay? Because this large part of my CV is supported by citation of these manuscripts. But it's not because of this, it's because they show it. What happened in the humankind, what several uh, questions that were addressed, mostly related to blood pressure, okay, in this case. Uh, look at the last manuscript uh, published last year. More than a thousand uh, investigations of population-based represent representative studies. No? Three of them are our, our studies here in Porto Alegre, with more than uh, another thousand, uh, under thousand million, excuse me, million participants. Okay. Uh, 3,000 were from our studies, okay? Small, small piece of that. But this is the contribute for the understanding of the problem here, that's the all our trends in hypertension, prevalence, progress, etc., etc., etc. Problems of career scientists in Brazil. This is, I think, that the main, the main uh, slide that I prepared, think, thought a little bit about, okay, to present to you. Huh? Uh, it still depends mostly of public funding, but it's improving. The career of professors and scientists in public universities are socialized by syndicates and governments. Okay? This is a critical issue. Okay? The salary is the same. In the first day at job, after a civil service examination, uh, our concursus, you know, I, I went to the, the translation to understand how do we say this in English. They do not have this kind of public servants. Uh, 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 Concourse or something like that, books the examination. But this the in the first day, the, the students here for post, uh, graduate program in surgery, if you uh, pass in a concurso for professor here, uh, in the first day after you sign the contract, you have tenure for all life. In the United States, to, be, to have tenure is one among a uh, thousand uh, professors, universities. Okay? It's a decision of the board after a strong uh, competition between candidates. Huh? Uh, the progress of career in wages are almost independently of productivity. It's the same for Brazil. Okay? Same. This does not, does not work. I, I do not, would not like to, to have higher wages. I would like to... This is just a, a way that the people need to compete for, huh? to get money, 
according to their merit. Uh, the progression uh, in, in 16 years, one of you with a doctoral degree oh, uh, uh, reached the top of career, okay? Full professor. And the salary increased at 5% at each two, two years, and when moved from uh, associated professor to full professor, more 20%. This was done by the people, by the people our syndicate, the government, and so on. Is it fair? No, we should discuss this, okay? We should discuss this. How much we expend in, to funding these activities in Brazil? Well, uh, the solution is uh, our interaction with private, huh? with private sector. Okay, I do not hope that the government should be responsible for increase this or that. Okay, this is my view. Evidence I denomination as my well. This is a problem for humankind, for for the whole, whole uh, world. My view. Uh, evidence, the uh, denomination that has mathematical roots, uh, evidence, 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 oh, it's mathematics. Uh, sometimes you can estimate the evidence indirectly, but you cannot affirm that the evidence is the true. And we suffer in these three years, almost three years now, uh, suffered very much. I suffered, and the Brazilian people suffered. The children in Brazil suffered a lot with the schools closed. We, Brazil, were the first place in the world in, in terms of time of closing schools, school for the children. Because the guys, I jacket the term evidence, acquired the bad habits to determine what you should do. No? Starting from outside Brazil and here in Brazil and so on, governments, virologists, press. I'm not talking uh, bad things about my colleagues. I do like them very much and so on, but the decisions were in large part wrong, at least in terms of isolated people. Do not permit that young guys continue their activities. As they had to continue, the people who took care of the things for us to live, they did not stop no, to work. No? Otherwise, we would not have uh, gas, energy, and so on. Science, despite to be heavily influenced by culture, emotions, and power, has a self-clearing uh, self core. Okay? I do believe, and then it finally provides the true knowledge. We should believe in science. In my last slides, uh, sites. Uh, not an author, but a philosopher, no? a Greek philosopher, no? uh, Epicuro, uh, whose one of the statements was living with virtue, proposed to live to, be live, to live with virtue, a culture. And I added, I add myself, science. Science. Okay? In the current days. In Nolan, you saw here, a name, where, who is Nolan? Is my grandson, the only one, okay, that uh, six or seven months ago was discovered with the age of three months old with a neuroblastoma, metastatic. The diagnosis were made by the, my son, his daddy, with a sign what a metastasis in the, in the orbiter. And then he answered very well to the first treatment and so on had good and bad criteria for prognosis, okay? And one month ago, one and a half months ago, one and a half months ago, he had a seizures you know, and uh, loss of uh, consciousness and so on. You know? He was dying. And then we call it a surgeon. Surgeon. Prepared surgeon. George Bizzi, everybody knows. Okay? It's left with me. I will resolve this. And with a small brain surgery, he drained more than 100 milliliters of blood. 
And now, just the day after, in the intensive care unit, he was, he still are, is this guy. Okay? This is science. Why you are here today? To praise science. But not only to praise, to work for science. And if possible, to be scientists. Okay? Because I met with this experience. What I met, everybody met with disease and problems of your, yourselves and your uh, relatives. Okay? And that one is Nolan last Saturday playing with me and my wife. Okay? And now, one is, it has uh, six uh, metastases in the brain. But there is any hope for Nolan? Yes, there is. Immunotherapy, together with chemotherapy. And he has already a passport to go to the United States, New York, to use a chemotherapy, intratrical huh? chemotherapy. The world changed with science. Okay? That's what we could, should do. And thereafter, we'll think about the great things of uh, uh, other problems that are really of minor, very, very minor importance. Feeling what we are feeling, I'm sharing with you, is surely everybody is, is uh, asking for Nolan, okay? And I hope that uh, Nolan meets some of you in the future, okay? Personally, coming to the university, to the School of Medicine with his own car. Okay? Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this idea with you. Thank you, Professor Flavio. <coughs> I would like to invite uh, Professor Ricardo to show us our <coughs> strategies for the next few years. So. Let's go there. When I started this program, I, I thought that I'd use a little bit. And after listening to my processors, I realized I don't know anything. And talked to Professor Ben during the time he's been here. He's been very humbling, you know. And, I start to rethink the way I think about things. So let's start to our, you do have it. Wait a second.
Okay. Technology is sometimes a, a pain in the neck, but it, I hope it works this time. So after all those lectures we have here, the, the whole idea was to, of this presentation, this course, is how to, we can improve our program to a better level. And we have been uh, learning all these procedures and inviting people with experience, as our previous lectures, to understand that. So, thanks God, see there's something there. Um, so the idea is to present our strategic planning. Most of Dr. Ricardo said and uh, Professor Fuchs uh, spoke. We want to share our experience of what we have done so far. Next two slides here. So, in April 2020, we uh, started to our strategic planning using the SWOT uh, tool. We send an online uh, inquirement query for our students, professors, and from here we were able to see our uh, oops, our strengths, our weakness, our opportunity, our uh, this threat that we have in our programs. And it's from the SWOT analysis, we start to planning our strategic planning. But at the same time, our university, our medical school, uh, presented their strategic planning. And we had to combine what the university and the medical school uh, gave as a strategic planning. And we have to uh, make everything in accordance to our program. So after this, the commission analyzed all the things, and we have this, our mission, our vision, and our values. And our mission is to generate knowledge to, for the development of science, use the cooperation of different sectors in training highly qualified professionals, researchers for the national and international market. Our vision, to be a program for excellence, recognized by internationally and by CAPS by 2028. And our values. What values are the things that drive us how to make decisions? Professionalism, it means that we are going to the thing based on criteria, transparency, cooperation, simplify process and maximize results. We're trying to be, as Professor Ricardo told before, to be uh, pragmatic in our results in some way. So from this, we had four main goals, knowledge, cooperation, professor, and national international market. To make things easier, we transformed these four goals in knowledge, cooperation, social impact, and alumni. How are we going to have for every one of them? Then they put all the our commission together. And for each of this, we have an objective, initiatives, actions, indicators, our review, and goals. For instance, to generate knowledge, how are we going to proceed to generate knowledge, how to do the cooperation, how do we make the social impact, and how we have to do the alumni. So for knowledge, our objective as a knowledge is to publish high-impact uh, articles in high journals, giving like the 200 points or more every two years. And what initiative we did? When we have this checkbox there, it means that we have done this. In the last we are trying to do is to have projects and editions. You understand that to be a professor, you need to have a project. You know, it need to be. We have to have a, something that we do research to have a junior scientific researcher. All the medical students, undergrads, should be part of our uh, re uh, scientific research. To seek partnership with industry, we're still trying to, to go further on this. To have our project revised by external peer reviews before we go further, to see if we what we're doing is a good research, have a good impact in our lives. Professor who published their paper, in high impact journal may have a financial bonus. 
that may be an incentive for professors to do this. We don't know whether you're going to get this funding, but probably it's be important for professors to have this uh, kind of incentivation. And the student must finish their dissertation masters in less than 24 months. So what is the action we had to do? Seminars with undergrads to make scientific questions. Every professor in the clinical grounds, they have questions, they're doing something. So from there, we can start to have questions to do from the clinical thing directly to the uh, research. And invited this undergrad, they make like a, a review of this. This review, the, the question can make uh, the introduction of a research for the project. Invite undergrads to participate in seminars to be a junior scientific researcher. Open opportunities in our website for research. Say they were doing this kind of research, you have this, maybe an industry you would like to, to support us. Participation of the from university, invite postdocs. That's a very important thing to realize that we are doing, we have alumni. We can invite these alumni to come to our program to help and keep doing the research. Online courses, trying to find another uh, financial resources. It to send direct mail to inform students about the timing course. Look, so far you've been doing six months. How far have you done? Are you going to be able to finish this in 24 months? So we have indicators for each one. So the first one, the number of professors with one or more projects over the 20 professors we have. Number of diplomas we have in the last 24 months over the number of total students in 24 months in one year. Number of submit and accept papers in junior with impact factor 2.1 over the number of submit articles in the same year. And these are our review, the check, our goals we have. The same we have for uh, cooperation. The idea is to have projects in cooperation with national, international members, and to encourage joint actions, cooperation of external researchers, institutions, external to the program. How would you do? establish cooperation with universities to invite national, international professors as a lecture in their classes? We've been doing this. To invite national, international professors to events in short visit. That's, this is the event. We have international professors here. Open opportunities for graduate students to, from other areas. We open up our uh, program for other areas because you want to expand knowledge. See, we understand that if you want to develop a new mechanism for laparoscopy, a mechanical engineer can be there, a guy from the TI can be there. So we can uh, broaden our area to create a committee of contact startups that will be interesting for us to have people that are trying to develop things. We want to have classes in English, but that's important. This uh, uh, meeting here, we are doing English to make this uh, international. It's going to be recorded. It's been recorded. It would be presented permanently for others to, to see us. Our website in three languages or more. And English will be one of the key factors for inviting our students. They should prove they have a TOEFL, IELTS, but remember what I said about being uh, maximize results, simplify process. If it doesn't have a TOEFL, IELTS, you can do, perform the interview in English. So you can see if the person has or no enough knowledge to carry on in our program. And give it research opportunity on social media. So like we have this clinical trial, we have this study open, we don't have any uh, master degree students, we don't have everybody Someone will get in, be part of this, it will be important. The indicators, the number of classes in English, it attracts students to social media, that's our indicators. Social impact, that's a quite important thing. To encourage professors to have active and scientific educational societies. CAPS gives a long list of the things that you should do. And every professor receives a card showing what are the list. And then they, they have this, and we say, well, we need to go for our strength. If you're doing this, you can carry on and say this in your 
uh, lattice. That's our CV. To share research activity with non-scientific societies. So it is to create textbook and chapter for undergraduate students, present preliminary results in National International Congress, produce classes for undergrad in the YouTube channel, and to encourage professors to review the part of the editorial board and international journals. So the same thing was, this is the list that we have. All the professors received this, this guideline. You now these are our four major goals. And say, look, this is the guidelines that we're going to follow to get a, a better, uh, to get better in our course. So here is the social impact, the thing, the number of activities professors do over there. And the alumni, we try to incentivate them to seek academic career and keep doing research. And here are the things that we did. We did a, a mail list for them to have a follow-up. And it was impressive what we had received from them. So the thing is, it is the indicators we have. So What's happening now, we have a dashboard of these indicators. Every time, six months or three months, you send an automatic email to them. They reply, and this re uh, reply is put in a spreadsheet, and that is automated to do this. So this is the first time we did. It was in June, and these are our indicators. As you can see, uh, ministering English was a problem. Now we solved this thing that for the next semester. Our uh, alumni employed in areas is bigger than they thought. The publication that they have, articles that you are doing, the submitting with high impact is not reaching the, the point we want, but we hope you're going there. And we are doing very good in social activities. You know, we have more than five the social impact. So I'm going to finish here. Uh, this presentation, this is our indicators. You know, and I hope to have from the audience and from the rest of our uh, members of this uh, table to help us to improve this. Thank you very much. Uh, we can have like a five minutes discussion for for oh, the professor Ricardo and Professor Fuchs. And then yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, do we have any questions from the, the audience for the professors? Otherwise I, I have some questions for for Professor Bertola. I think you 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 really point something that uh, as uh, Ricardo just saw, uh, we are trying to that uh, is uh, dealing with our research uh, in the benefit of the community. Like uh, you have the social uh, uh, function of the university. How we can do you think we can improve this, uh, especially in our field uh, surgery? Because uh, Ricardo thought something about that we have some problems like developing new instruments. We did, uh, I have one, one of my uh, research fields are new instruments for laparoscopy, for example, and we have a lot of problems with uh, patents pending and uh, uh, trying to, to change this into a real product. So do you have any experience with that or UNIFESP has anything that you can share with us? So our, our patent office was recently increased towards an agency. We have a, a social and technological innovation agency. Um, tech transfer at, in federal institutions in Brazil is still a problem because we need to pay for, for patents and we don't have money to pay for patents because of the way we are structured towards, you know, um, a public, uh, we need to purchase ahead of time, etc. What we are trying to do is to delay patents as much as possible. But we have to think that that's not the only contribution that we can bring in, in terms of new, I mean, we, we can contribute with guidelines, definitely. 
And what we're trying to do more at our graduate program is to also demonstrate treating alternatives and how that, that can impact the cost for the public health system, because that's a big issue in Brazil. We have a big public health system in Brazil um, that is very heterogeneous. We have, it's, it's concentrated in capitals and not in, you know, some areas of Bristol have a lot of treatments, other don't, but uh, some learn more with more technology, others don't. So I think that we can contribute with costs as well. That's a, a big area. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fuchs, uh, what is your, like your main, uh, we are trying to get back our doctorate so far, so, and you have a, a very strong program, so what do you think should be our main goal in this search? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, as a matter of fact, I do not have the, the, a large experience with research in surgery, okay? Surgery was uh, among our, our foundations of uh, scientific medicine, okay? And then you start to, to surgery, start to do procedures to change our lives. Okay. Um, currently, I think that was something that was uh, su suggested by Ricardo Savares. We do have two Ricardos here um, to 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 get the, the help of other 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 areas. Okay. Uh, I think they should think uh, some seminar. Uh, uh, um, among yourselves, okay, debating, looking at the, the, the things that are being done. No? I, I think that one of the best strategies to, 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 to get good indices is the good production. No? And just um, uh, among us, uh, to make others to work with us, no? to make others to work with us. I, I think the surgeons no? are typical guys to do that because you, you do have initiative, the leadership. Yeah? And, uh, to, to, to solve problems, okay? And then you should, I think you should uh, gather uh, people no? from the, the areas, the complementary, the, and, the, and, the, and the edge of knowledge in surgery. No? I think in terms of informatics and, uh, no? and uh, even experimental models and other things, okay? Uh, the, the, the best way to do this, Sandra, my wife, has done something in this, uh, he has collaboration with people of informatics uh, and images and so on. No? I've done a lot of things together, okay? And these people, uh, these people who are in university, okay? They work in departments so, uh, around, no? and they usually to be very happy to be invited to work with us. No? This is a, uh, a suggestion, uh, uh, one specific suggestion. No? I was thinking about this already. But I, sh I think that it should pursue this, not to, 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 to look for this kind of guys. Cooperative, any paper, look at this, for biostaticians and others, any paper published is part of their careers in university, okay? And, and they, they have people to work uh, by their salary. You are not going to give to pay them. I have a question here. Just uh, since I, we are doing this, uh, after my presentation, all the strategic planning in there, are we going in the right direction? It'll be for Ricardo. So uh, at the disclosure that I gave during my presentation still persists in that it's very hard to have a very straight answer, but I really liked what you presented. I really liked the way you're structuring your planning, and it, it seems that it, you know, it is likely that it is... Uh, in the right direction, yes. W what I would suggest is when you prepare your, when eventually you, you, know, you get up to a grade where you can apply for a doctor program after you're up, up to grade four, and you know, things are looking good, then you're going to need to prepare a proposal. And when you prepare your proposal, you have to be very sure that it is aligned with the institutional planning. Don't, that's something that we, we, we see a lot missing when we're there assessing, you know, proposals is uh, institutional ali uh, uh, alignment, I would say. So I think that's important in the future. But I really think, you know, it was a very good presentation, yeah. Um, uh, any questions from the audience? 
So uh, I would like to thank Professor Ricardo and Professor Flavio for being with us and for sharing their experience. And I would like to invite you for a 15-minute break, uh, coffee break that we're going to have between sessions. And uh, we are allowed to talk in Portuguese for a while. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, this is red. Uh, I, th I think that you are familiar with the, with the RedCap platform. Um, it's available in our hospital uh, in most of the universities uh, as well. And it's a very reliable. It's in accordance with the legislation uh, for data protection uh, in, in mo most of the uh, in world, not with the LGPD here in Brazil yet, but with the GDPR. Uh, there is quite similar, okay. Um, there's a lot of quality control as well uh, in the in the such tool. And this is uh, our uh, our front end page uh, in the in our hostel uh, where you can see when you can uh, find how to apply to get your account to Redcap. The, the project needs to be uh, approved. Uh, for this. And I will tell my, uh, something just about um, publication ethics, okay? It's not about integrity, it's about publication ethics, uh, such mechanisms that editors uh, may use and authors and, and so on um, to make better science. So reproducibility, okay, that's not new. We talk about reproducibility of findings nowadays and we, tell like John Ioannidis um, quotes uh, times and times and times, tone of times that we, we are living a reproducibility crisis uh, about the results um, in, we don't know if there is a crisis. There is a lack of reproducibility, but we don't know if it's just because we are knowing right now or because uh, it arise over time, okay, rose. And, um, Institutions play a role, play a big role on that, and I'll talk about that. And there is like, in about integrity, uh, institutions also play a role. But I will not talk about such integrity in details because it's a broad term as well. It's just a compendium also, it's a cycle. It's not because they're my publications, but it's because are, uh, they, they fit uh, on what I'm talking right now, um, is that the Mertonian norms, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Mertonian norms, but uh, it's not new, okay, it's from the 40s. Um, there are principles uh, we are not addressing nowadays. Like when he talks about commonality, it's about sharing the results. When he talks about disinterdeness, this this it's about equipoise, true equipoise when running a clinical trial. When he talks about organized skepticism, he's talking about Professor Flavio. So uh, uh, that is a, a thing we need to, to see, okay? And empirically, we found that in the cardiology journals, the reproducibility po policies are such a mess, sorry about the term, but yes, it's lack, lacking, lacking, lacking. It's, it's in the review of this paper. Um, also, uh, we found that there are 74 or more uh, ways to track a predatory journal, okay? And I, 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 the predatory journals not, <laughs> nowadays, they are like a factory uh, or in the business or something like that, you know? And, it's just because the carrot that uh, institutions, and not the Brazilians only, but all of them uh, teach us uh, that we need to pursue, that is publication output and preferable in a higher impact factor. But it doesn't mean that's, that is the best way to communicate the evidence because if I have an evidence that is directed to obstetricians, for example, it's maybe better than to, pub to, to uh, publish it uh, in the uh, Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, for example, that might have the uh, highest impact factor, okay? So you need to target your audience. Your audience. We, don't, we need to remember uh, for what serves the publication. It's not about to make career, but that's the way the 
the environment, the ecosystem uh, fitted us, and I mean as well, unfortunately. And finally, we have a problem with taxonomies uh, and, and such mechanisms that editors may use and in the way that the self-correction uh, profile of science is made, okay? Please um, don't waste and stop this waste of people, animals and money, and I mean as well, again, because I don't know how to stop that, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this lovely presentation, very inquisitive. Uh, the next speaker in our program will be, let me see here, creating a collaboration and obtaining funding. Professor Concepta McManus, and she, I don't have here your paper, sorry for <laughs> professor. And she's a professor at the University of uh, Brasilia. She's also a, a high level research, 1A from campus, and she has a lot of uh, collaboration things. She's originally from Ireland, but she's living here in Brazil for many years. Sorry for not having the whole presentation, but you're far, far beyond our... Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, I thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I hope you understand my English. <laughs> because I, I do have a, an accent in English. <laughs> but uh, so uh, I was asked to talk about uh, creating collaborations and obtaining funding. One of my previous lives, I was director for international affairs in CAPS for around about almost four years. So this is, uh, and since then we have been working very hard to try and open people's eyes to exactly what goes on and how things can change and need to change within the, the postgraduate system and the research system in Brazil. So um, the, there's, a, there's a lot of things that have been going on. Everybody talks about money, <laughs> obviously. Uh, the COVID crisis, a lot of criticism as to the usefulness of what's being produced in science and if it actually has a, a like if, if the money that is being invested is actually worthwhile and that there is any sort of impact with it social impact and then how can we influence policies that actually ha have meaning and, and, and look towards uh, building a stronger future for Brazilian science. And so um, it, it, this is not a, a Brazilian problem. It's a worldwide problem. Uh, there's a lot of questions about this investment that is going into science as a whole. But I think one thing that we need to be, uh, we just have to dig ourselves in, I think, and then change some of our own attitudes as to how, and to show what we are doing is actually worthwhile and how we can, how we can make this more evident. And one of the ways that we can do this is through international, international collaboration and, and our, our programs using internationalization as a form of extending our impact. And that's one thing I think that we need to be very, very clear about. Internationalization is not an end. It is a means to an end. So when you hear somebody, oh, we want to internationalize, internationalize our, our program, th that's, not what we, that's not what we do. What we need to do is see how we can use international uh, methods or conver co uh, conversations or whatever to improve the science that we produce in Brazil and that our science here has a, has a, more, has a wider re uh, a reach. Um, so therefore, we have to think strategy and not the activity in itself. So what, do we, what, do we, what is internationalization and then how, do, how can we use that uh, to, to, uh, to be more effective in what we are doing? Um, and for that, then we need to have a goal. 
you know, where do I want to go? What am I doing? Uh, once I know what I'm doing and where I want to go, then we have to do why. Why am I doing this? Is it worthwhile? When I'm doing this, is saying, how am I going to get there? And what are the methods that I'm going to use to get there? So therefore, we have a series of, of, of decisions that we have to make when we're going to, do, uh, when, we're, we're, when, we're, uh, when we're creating this strategy then that we're going to use to improve the quality, not only of, of the formation of our undergrad or of our postgraduate students in this case, but also of the, of the science that's being produced. And that starts with this. Why me? What makes me special? What makes people want to integrate with me or my course or my students? And if I don't can't, and, and one of the real problems that I see with the CAPS evaluation, and you know that I, I say this in a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of talks, I say that the CAPS evaluation is very linear. It takes everybody from the same point to the same point. It looks at everybody in the same way. It looks at everybody who's working in Rio Grande do Norte or Amazonas or Rio Grande do Sul, and it asks them to do everything without difference. But we know that people are different. There are different ways of getting there. And 52% of the CAPS evaluation is process and not the, the end result. And surely we should be evaluating the end result. What I say is what, uh, if, we want to climb, if we want to get to the top of Everest, I can go up the north face, I can go up the south face, or I can get a helicopter. Does it interest how I get there as long as I get there? And so uh, I would say that we really, really need to think more rationally about how we do this, uh, you know, where we want to go. Obviously, the strategy of how we're going to get there depends on each of us individually, each course individually, each professor individually, each student individually. But then we have to see that, you know, I have to get there. How am I going to get there? And it's different for every one of us because we all start from different positions. We have different problems. And when we get, but as long as we get there in the end, I think that's what we really need to, to look about. Um, so therefore, when we look at the development of research and uh, academy in, in general, what, what, what do we have to look at? We want to attract international partnerships, do high impact research, and that has an academic or a commercial or a social value. So um, looking at the here then, one of the ways of doing this is to increase partnerships with international institutions, not necessarily academic institutions. We can think of other uh, institutions that can also help us in this case. In, in the medical area, for example, there's a lot of international uh, pharmaceutical companies that do research. There's a lot of um, PEEP or, or uh, other institutions that use medical research for different ends. And one of the things you were talking about, I remember a little bit earlier on, was the question of uh, mechanics. There's a postgraduate course in the US that the undergraduates have to be medical students and the postgraduate course is in engineering. And it's, so it's, it's actually medical engineering and if you need information about it, uh, the, the person to contact is the director for the Fulbright Commission in Brazil, uh, uh, Loreiro. I can give you, I can pass you his telephone number later on. But So they, th there is a lot of different ways of thinking about things that uh, so you don't necessarily have to, th it's more interesting to think outside the box than do everything the same way that everybody else is doing. Um, so in this strategic planning, we need to not only know where we want to go, but how we're going to get there. And how do I know I'm getting there? So therefore we need some benchmarking. And benchmarking does not have to be necessarily bibliographic me measures. It can also be other measures, like I, I see that you're trying to do some different in, uh, social insertion and all of this side of stuff. So not necessarily, but benchmarking is important to know that the strategy that we have, we're starting to use has, is uh, working. But we always have to do benchmarking against the best. No, you know, uh, uh, because I, I, if we want to be the best, we can't actually do a benchmarking against people that are worse than us. So therefore, think about who you want to be, or wh what is the level you want to get there, and then benchmark against that. And then you need criteria to focus on critical areas to, to improve the quality. So what are the criteria I'm going to use to, to say 
that how am I going to improve the quality of what I'm doing? And then see if those, those work in our case. And then you have to say, if it doesn't work until then, until this point, then I'm going to have to change my strategy. Now, in the question of internationalization, this up until recently is what has been thought is internationalization, whereas internationalization is a whole different thing. It's not mobility. Mobility can be important. It can be used as a, as a tool, but internationalization is actually a whole series of other activities that goes from increasing our understanding, including our cultural understanding. We also have to look and see about competitivity, uh, impact and social relevance in what we're doing, uh, contracting people, like they actually have, uh, um, use internationalization to actually improve who, who we interact with and who could be our professors in the, in the near future or students in the near future. Uh, networking. Opa. So, oh, I can't, I can't do this. Uh, networking, to improve who we talk to and that the people that we are talking to are relevant. Constructing our curriculum. So there are a whole series of things that we can use internationalization as well as simply, uh, simply, uh, say, uh, simply using mobility as, as the be end and all then and end all of internationalization. Um, it doesn't want to go forward. Can you move it? Se pode chegar para frente para mim, for? Um, so internationalization, then we can create networks. And this creation of networks then is important, not only for creating multi-scientific domains, but we also look beyond geographical frontiers. And not only networks that can be national as well as international, and one of the things that can also be within our own institution, we can create networks that we don't have up today. And then we can also go networks beyond academy. And then here, I think this is the network, is this one of your networks? <laughs> Um, whereby I, I, I used a program to create networks for, uh, for the, the department here, for the postgraduate course here. Can you go forward, please? It doesn't want to work. Poggi para French, favor. So this is, these are your lectures that you have in the course here. And here we can see who they who are the main lecturers, who, who they're based on, and who they connect with. And from here then you can see, okay, so what are the areas that these people work in? The, the, this program also gives me these results. And then I can also see through this program who cites me. And so those people who are actually citing me, especially those people abroad, then they could be potential partners. So therefore, by studying the networks that we actually have at the minute, we can actually broaden our horizons to incorporate new people into the networks. So here's what your course actually, who, who, who they're actually collaborating with. You see Brazil is the main course. Oh, the Brazilians are your main contacts, but they have some contact in the United States and then a, another huge potential increase in, in, in collaborations that can be explored maybe to a, better, uh, to a better end. Because you see each point, each node is very small, therefore it's not very significant in the whole analysis. But then if we could increase the size of those nodes, obviously it would be more important. Can you go forward please? And these are your keywords. And one of the questions when we look at the key words, networks, is that they're highly dispersed. It's very hard to see something consistent within the keywords. And this is one of the reasons why maybe keywords and publications are so important, is that if somebody is looking for you or looking for a publication on something specific and your keywords are very general, they're not going to find you. So here, for example, I have quality of life. Quality of life is, is very generic, maybe, or rats. So rats as a keyword, is it, is it a useful keyword? Will it help people find my study? Does it tell me anything about what was studied? 
or would it, maybe I wasted a key word where I could have used something else if somebody is looking for me. We see other, um, other prognosis here, for example, skin disease, child or children. So there are a lot of words maybe that are wasted, whereby we could have used something else that would have been more useful if people were looking for our studies or looking for, for interest uh, more in more specific themes. Opa. Okay. So let's say I don't have any international collaboration. Where can I start? So here is a, is a, a forum. It's called AuthorAid. And I can actually post on this forum saying, listen, I, I, I work in this area. I really, looking for, I, I really need somebody who works also in this area. Can you please help me? And so, and so, so this may be a, a, an idea for how, how you can start in, 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 in having international or even national collaborations, maybe if you don't have them at the minute. Uh, Ricardo has this presentation, so you don't need to, to copy anything here. Um, obviously, you can't, there's things that you can't negotiate. You can't negotiate method. I think that's what the <laughs> professor earlier on said. You cannot negotiate ethics and social responsibility, and you cannot ne negotiate honesty, objectivity, and transparency. Those are three things. So when you do create a collaboration, these are things that have to be on the basis of the collaboration. Um, can you go forward, please? Uh, OK. Give up with this. Funding. <laughs> Funding, Brazil obviously at the minute is, is reduced, but there are foreign funders. I, I just took a list off the, off the, off the internet who are, whereby you can look for funding. Intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental funding as well is, highly, is available. Sometimes you just have to go after looking, looking for it or looking for people who have availability. For example, an NIH. So maybe you have to have an, a partner in another country or whatever to have access, but there are loads of places that you can actually look for funding, even if it's not uh, necessarily just in, in Brazil, which obviously at the minute is, is maybe, maybe restricted. The next page, please. Oh, I can know. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Um, so, where to find funding? So, you can, there are several sites. There are sites with various options, for example, SPIN or COS or Research Research or Newton's List. Or These are, are sites that give you various options to look for research. There are foundations. For, normally, foundations have specific interests. So, there is the, for example, Cystic Fibrosis or um, Chest Foundation Research or Bill and McGill... Uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, or for example, or government resources such as USAID or Illumina or INSERM that have specific programs as well that may be available. There is also this site, which is the SDG Fund, whereby they also give resources for funding, uh, mainly directed towards the SDGs. The third SDG is health and well-being. So I obviously you're probably fit pretty well in that. So it, it, it's much a question of looking for it. And maybe if you do need to for international uh, collaboration or national collaboration, then the, the, the methods that are there to, to do that. The other question is also collaborating with other areas of knowledge, because if everybody agrees with what I'm doing or everybody is, it does everything the way I'm doing, you're not innovating. So the idea, too, of, of creating uh, contacts with people outside your area of knowledge or people that necessarily don't agree with you is good because it leads to discussion, which leads to new ideas, which leads to an increase in, the, in, um, in innovation in the science that we're doing. So my area is genetics. And obviously, genetics has a lot to do with biology, statistics, physics, 
chemistry, animal production, animal genetics, yeah? medicine. We also do a lot of stuff together with people in medicine. And so we, want, we need that these areas that they become closer together. And the only way that we can go to do that are by communication. So if we don't communicate, obviously, with people in other areas or in other universities and other countries, then we're not going to be able to, to improve or put ourselves in the position whereby we can utilize the, these resources. What I say today is my, my biggest collaborator is actually, I work in genetics and they work in geography. So we joining forces, we've managed to, to, to create a research group, which is, uh, we're doing a lot of stuff that no other people are doing because we, we it's, we're, not everybody is doing the same thing. People are doing different things with the same data. But um, communication also has a lot to do with, if nobody knows you're there, how are they going to, going to join in your, your groups? So therefore, I think it's important then that we use uh, other strategies for communication. I think that was also what the, the previous speaker said, is that we can't stay within our comfort zone, maybe. Um, oh, sorry. Um, here is a, a study that was in PLUS One in 2020, I think, that looked at what, how researchers communicate. And as you see, uh, congresses and academic journals are very popular. But then as we go up here, you see the, sec the communication secretary for the university, and then we have journals, and, and then we get up here to Twitters and blogs and stuff, which are n practically nobody using them to... to, to like say what we're doing. And so maybe we should think also of using different methods of communicating and to get her the message out there, not just in the scientific community, but also in the general community. And to show people what we're doing actually has an impact in society. Um, social networking, obviously, there are t many, many different uh, platforms that we can use. Each platform has a different use, has a different end use. LinkedIn is like an interview room. Twitter is like a coffee table. Uh, Facebook is a bar on a Friday night. Uh, Instagram is your photograph album. P interest is a notice board. So use them. You can use some of them, use all of them. But try and think of how you can put your message out there in a different way so that you become more, uh, uh, more relevant within the, the, the scientific system. Next one, please. We have to remember that communication is a two-way street. It's not just from us to them. It's also us to them and them to us. Not only uh, them being the government, them being society, them being the, um, uh, who's going to finance you, them being basically everybody else. <laughs> So think about that, you know, you're not just producing science for you, you're producing science for everybody and everybody has to be on board, or most everybody, to know that that is very important for the, for the, not only for your advantage, but for their advantage as well. Um, next one. So we have to have the focus. Our focus is on reputation. We need to build a reputation, we need to be visible. We have to, uh, like they say, uh, what is uh, Caesar's wife? Not only be honest, you have to be seen to be honest. So it's not always you know, that you produce science, but you have to be seen to produce science of good quality. Globalization. Our students today, like, they, they're no longer being contracted only within the academic system. They have to look for other means or, or other jobs outside academia. So we can't just form them for academia. How are we going to do that? So what other skills are we giving them to look towards soft skills as to communication, soft skills as uh, and, uh, building their own businesses, soft, there are lots of other skills maybe that they need that we actually have to look to as well. Strategic planning, where I want to go, how I'm going to get there, and then research development obviously is also very important within this system. Say, so, next one please. Here's your funding, okay. CNPQ caps is around 15%. The hospital itself is 10%. Fatberg, 
And then you see here that we have some other funding from NIH. Um, the, this is also NIH, MC CHIC, US Department. So there is, you know how to get funding. Maybe just know how to get increase the funding that is available to you. Next one. So they maybe have to create some digital skills. Next one. And this is something that can't wait in this world. Digital skills, maybe, ah, I don't know how to do it, I'm not going to bother. Maybe just a little bit of, of putting yourself out there and this sort of terms, like m making a Facebook page or an Instagram or something and putting messages on there about what you're doing can increase your visibility. These platforms, I know that ResearchGate, every week I receive five, six, seven requests for, for preprints or postprints or whatever. So obviously it's a good way of increasing visibility. Orc ID is fundamental, I think, today and for anybody who's publishing. I don't think we can avoid it. Research your ID, have a Google Scholar, create a Google Scholar for yourse yourself so that everybody knows that if they're looking for something that you can find you in Google Scholar. LinkedIn, workspace not so much anymore. Edge, every type of social media is different but know how to use it and maybe think of using it in English instead of using it in Portuguese. Um, and think about uh, how maybe as a group you can join together and then have something going out every week or uh, every couple of weeks to maintain interest in what you're doing here within the, in the faculty. Next. Create online tours. If somebody goes abroad, two minute video to show where they went, what they did, what was interesting or something about the labs where you're working. What, what you do in your lab that is different, what you do in your lab that maybe calls interest and then put a, a link to it that can go out on, on, on social media and say, listen, if you want to see what we do, here we are. And then there's lots of little videos that people can see there. Here's, for example, uh, on in experimental installations on this lab tour or Baylor University pre-health is there, so there are lots of ideas out there to increase visibility. If you don't have these plans, you'd, it's like herding cats. Herding cats, you see, the, I think the dog is much more interesting. You see, she gets her puppy here, you see? And when she puts her puppy in there, she has to go and cry because the other one ran away, and then she takes that back. So if you, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have a plan, you don't have a strategic plan, you don't have a control in place, you're never gonna get there. So organize your, uh, organize, organization is very important when we want to get where we want to, to get going where we want to go. Uh, know where you want to go. Uh, in CAPS in 2017, we, 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 we asked the postgraduate coordinators, what's the most important thing about the future of internationalization? Almost 100% said having a strategic plan. So therefore, if we don't have a strategic plan and your GPS says turn left now, basically you know what's going to happen. Next. And also remember that to build an aeroplane, an aeroplane is built not by a single company, it's built by everybody. So we have, you see the forward fuselage is made in Kansas, the next part is made in Japan, the next part is made in Italy, and then the one wing is made in California. And the other one, another bit is made in Oklahoma, and another bit is in the UK, and another wheels are made in Gloucester. And, and so how do I make a piece that's important to build an airplane that functions better? I think that's what we need to think about. And then, you know, it doesn't have to be today. It's a plan. It's a process. It's a, it's a future. Um, so I have to go and do this now. No. Let me think about how I'm going to do it and plan it out. And think, um, you know, you might think, you know, it's hard at the minute. We have, we're having a hard time. We don't have money. You know, the prospects are, 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 are a bit dim and things are a bit gloomy, etc. But you have to think that the glass is always full. It's full of something. And this may be a good time to rethink what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how we can get there, and how we can get there when times get better. Or even when we don't have money, how we can do things without money, so when we do have money, we can do them better, you know? Uh, think as 
the postgraduate system as an ecosystem that involves interdisciplinary work, innovation, social responsibility. These are not things that are disconnected one from the other. And internationalization is one of these things that's within this, the whole, this whole system. And that maybe you think that, oh, I can't change, you know, everything goes, you know, at least I'm doing what everybody else is doing, so it must be all right. No, you know, I think we need to change. Uh, Professor Fuchs said about the Parise Sukupira. Parise Sukupira is 70 years old. It's a very well written Parise. There's a lot of things, uh, really, really worthwhile reading it. Really, really worthwhile. I think you should, because 70 years ago they had some very, very, very important insights into postgraduate studies. But the end of postgraduate studies changed a lot. So while the Parise is very important, we have to think that things change. And things change, for example, at the time that was for formation of, of postgraduate students to be lecturers in universities. Nowadays, the postgraduate system is no longer has that as, a, as the end, the B end and all end of it, uh, the B end and all end of it all. <laughs> so, you know, have a look at the Parisé, but also think about the future and not necessarily the past. I think this is important. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> I think that's another thing that we have to be very, very, very sure about, that it's, it's, it's an investment, it's not a cost. Next. I know it's complicated. Next. Next. Um, and I'd like to end my lecture with this, to think about the perfect man. So you can, you, all the men can just close their ears and just talk. Uh, next. So everybody has an image in their mind, uh, with the women, I'm going to say, or whatever. Uh, what's the perfect man? You know, what you think, ah, what do I need? So normally when I have a, an objective, then I normally have to write down my objective. Next. So I say, okay, what I like, I want him to smile and laugh. I want him to give me hugs. I want him to listen to me. I want to give me presents. What have I just described? That. Does that appear like what I had the pictures? Nothing like what I had the pictures. So if I don't know where I want to go, and I don't describe it properly, I'm never going to get there. Next. So that's what I'm going to be like. So I think the process is very important is when we construct the, uh, the, this, our strategic plan. We have to be very clear what we want, very clear in how we describe it, very clear in how we des describe the process so we can actually get to where we want to get going. Next. Um, Remember that uh, research partnerships are like a marriage, okay? The same way marriages you join together and everything's wonderful at the beginning, they can end like the half, like uh, my washing machine and you know, half the washing machine, every half of everything is mine. Like research partnerships are the, uh, and can end the same way. So very important that you maintain communication, maintain the collaboration. If it's not working, it's okay if it doesn't work. Okay, but think very carefully on how you end it in an amicable fashion so that both of you can move on without major um, complications. Uh, I think that's the end of it. Uh, no, I don't need this. This is just some extra data for, your, for you that I haven't got. So, no, no precisa, no. So, because I, I did some data for Hickard just to have some more things. So that's what I'd like to say, and I hope I helped something. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Ben Mull. I need the glasses now. He will talk about how to publish high-impact journals. Publishing high impact articles, Professor Ben Mall. I like to give him. Now I have the, the paper here. Uh, Professor Ben Mall said that around medical, around the world, medical practices, if no evidence are conducted normally, without considering whether those interventions are beneficial to the patient and will cause harm or not. Uh, this Professor Mall also like to. 
to give the, his talk to this for us. And he's been a, a prolific professor giving their, uh, oh my gosh, here you go. Um, prolific production papers, and he will give uh, this talk about publishing. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, thanks for the hospitality over the last uh, 24 hours. It's the first time we meet, but I'm really enjoying it, and I'm also joining this symposium as well as the morning in the hospital. And it's actually a surprise to me. I mean, we came in contact because Ricardo reached out to me on ectopic pregnancy, a point where we, a topic where we both, um, I'm looking the pointer, oh, yeah. a topic where we, where we both uh, um, uh, do research in, and we have written a paper together now. Uh, but I wasn't expecting actually to talk about the, the for the surgical school um, with so many, so, so many prominent speakers in the faculty about this theme. And I'm just going to give, apart from my slides, a couple of observations. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, so my conflict of interest, apart from financial interest not relevant for this talk, is that I am a 1965 home delivery, 4,300 grams, 42 weeks and three days. So for the obstetricians of you, I'm happy to be alive according to modern standards. And this is my mum, who is still living in the same house. She's 89 now, touching 90 um, in uh, November. And this is my CV. And, and I, I think that's actually quite important to realize where you come from and what you've done. So I'm, uh, I'm married. I have a daughter. I live in Australia. I studied in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm trained as a clinical epidemiologist, but I also studied economics. So I've, I've gone to other specialties, uh, so to say. And then after becoming a, a, a clinical doctor, a gynecologist, um, I started to do clinical research. Um, I moved to Australia in 2014. Also in the Netherlands, I've moved a lot of places. I would encourage everyone to move and challenge yourself. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So you always learn from going to um, uh, other places. Um, Brazil, uh, so was an unknown country for me. I was 17 years old when this team was playing um, uh, until they met Paolo Rossi, but I think it was the, the best football team ever in the world. And your teams are Grêmio and uh, uh, Internacional, and I, I know still that Grêmio and Ajax, my team from Amsterdam, played in, uh, I think, 1995 in the World Cup final. Um, so one observation that I'm just going to do is if you want to improve, think about gender balance and think about racial balance. Because I see that this room is dominated by white men, so that means that we are only using about 25 to 30 percent of the capacity that is in the country to move uh, forward. Just a comment. So yeah, I'm Dutch, uh, so that means that I, I say what I think. And I'm even so Dutch that the Dutch kicked me out of the country. So um, um, that's the reason I, I just say what I think. I started my PhD in 1993 with a study on ectopic pregnancy. So that's how you spotted me. Uh, funding was arranged. We thought we we're going to randomize 250 women easily, but it was a tough journey. And after four years, we had 100 women publish the paper in The Lancet. That was good. But the confidence intervals around our observation were enormously wide. And from that, I, I, I learned that you should collaborate. So then I started to write grants myself. I already did that when I was a registrar. Um, and when I got my first grant, which was in infertility research, I realized that I should start to work immediately with the whole country together. And the Netherlands is a small country, so you can have a meeting face to face and still at the end of the day, everybody sleeps in his own bed, but the red dots were the hospitals that I got engaged in my research from the beginning. And that went well because we did over the years uh, a series of good studies, um, now and then Lancet, BMJ. But the problem we had was that after every study, 
the PhD student disappeared and therefore all the knowledge disappeared. And then a new PhD student came and you could kind of restart. So your story, for example, about trial registration, I've never done a study with perfect registration because the registration is always done by someone who hasn't done it before, so to say. So you always make mistakes there. And I learned from that and inspired also by other networks. This is the NIH CHD network that did fantastic trials in our field. We start, decided to work collaboratively. So in 2003, a couple of years after my PhD, we organized a meeting where we said we're gonna do things different. We're gonna run a series of studies together and each is owner of one study. And what we also did is we brought facilities together. So not everybody making his own database, but one central database, ethics, a collaborative approach, and very important, research nurses. So we shifted recruitment from the studies, from the PhD students and the young doctors to nurses who did that um, uh, specifically. So this is the ideal PhD student who does everything, right? The professor gets money, appoints a PhD student and says, good luck, I see you one time a month. Uh, but I don't think that that works. And, and what we did is we, we tried to, to create specialized functions with everybody his own um, uh, specific... Um, oh, it's going a bit too fast. It doesn't move, but it, it should be a circle where the PhD student is si still central and everybody has its, um, has its um, uh, own specialty. And the other thing we did, instead of each professor saying, we are going to do uh, our own study, which is this model, right? Everybody is calling, everybody is thinking about me. We said, we're gonna plan centrally, make a line of studies and make sure that we pay attention to every study. And that resulted in a series of papers. And what, one thing I think, I think I did well, I made sure that everyone on the table had an interest to come. So I gave everybody the prospect of being last author in a big paper or having a PhD in their own set. I'm quite proud actually that I've been a PhD supervisor in all eight universities in the Netherlands, which is I think a track record that not many people have, but it, it, it shows that if you prepare to share, you can grow bigger. So what happened? Number of randomizations went up, um, number of studies we did, went faster, so the first studies took three, four years, we became better and we took two years for a study. And when I left 2013, another important thing happened, the insurance company stepped in. Because we should not forget, and it's not been touched about this afternoon, that one of the main shareholders is the persons who pay for healthcare. And in your situation, I think that's the public system. And I was yesterday at uh, Campinas University and I understood that your budget for healthcare is 160 billion real, something about that, overall for the whole country. Um, so this is how I started as a PhD student, right? I did everything myself. And this is the model how I think it should be that you uh, collaborate. I took this picture, by the way, on the Dutch Society for Midwifery. Um, and I touched upon that we don't know exactly what we're doing in healthcare. So, so, so this is an opportunity. If you look at current healthcare, and I think it's also true for Brazil, then this is the UK, 3,000 interventions. Green, 33%. We do it and we know that it works, which is great. 8%, we do it, but it might harm or it doesn't work. Uh, we can improve there. And then there's the gray zone. But the big elephant in the room is that, who is a doctor in this room? So 50% of what you do, you actually do not know if it helps your client or your patient. Now, Connie, any company with a budget of 160 billion real, where the CEO says, I actually don't know what half of the things we do is helping our clients. And that is the opportunity. So what happened in the Netherlands, there was a, a discussion with the insurance companies and they actually stepped in and started to pay this type of research rather than the funders. 
the competition for the funding is not with your colleague, but it is with unevaluated research. So if you do a procedure and you do not know what you're doing, then you shouldn't compete with another colleague who doesn't know it exactly, but you should compete with unevaluated care, so to say. The comparison is, am I going to continue with three or four years doing a procedure where I actually don't know it's helping, or I'm going to evaluate it, and then after three or four years, I'm actually able to say it works or it doesn't work. So why I am on this podium on this topic, because if you put my name into PubMed, you get, what is it, uh, 1,485 hits. Now, I actually have two cousins with the same initials. No, that's a joke. <laughs> um, but I think I'm quite proud to say that wherever I go, so my last two papers are actually with, with Chinese uh, collaborators. I, I publish well. And I will just share some things that, 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 that I think are part of my philosophy. One is recruit patients. So think about your design, get things organized, but at some stage, get going, right? And the 30% that is not perfectly organized will be organized along the way. Don't make the car too heavy in the beginning because it will not depart. So I've done that with my studies where other people thought, oh, we're not ready, et cetera, et cetera. Keep it simple. So one study, one question. Choose, I choose my questions from my own clinical experience. So when I was a registrar, I had a kind of a, a hard drive here that when I saw something happening, and people did it, and I thought, well, I actually don't know. That, that became a list, and then when the opportunity came, I'll give some examples of that, we evaluated. But I think starting from what is clinically important, and choose contrast. So nobody is interested in, I should be careful here because we divided, decided to do a study, but kind of having 50 milligrams or 75 milligrams of a particular drug, right? Choose, do surgery, or do the drug. That is what the big journals want. Another important thing is, so realize that, that many of the decisions in medicine are taken from a clinical perspective. So if you are going to observe clinical reality and you're going to do your research from that perspective, you're already 3 nil down, right? There is all bias in what's happening there. So what at some stage you have to do, you have to turn it around and say, this is my research question, and I'm actually going to determine what's going to happen in the clinic. So that can happen through randomization, but it can also happen to a standardized protocol. But at some stage, you have to, if you keep on doing retrospective studies, you're not going to find answers that, that people will be interested in. Randomize is important. You, you know what the two most difficult moments are in a randomized clinical trial for a doctor? Two moments. Tell me. What are the two doctors are scared to death, really? Right? Who has randomized in the last week? One. Two. Who has randomized in the last month? One. Two. Who has randomized in 2022? Why is it so, why is it so scary? It is scary because of this. Doctors have to say to their patients, I don't know what is best for you. My good, there goes your ego, right? I mean, Germany, RCT is impossible because, because doctors can't say that, right? For a, pa for a doctor to say to a patient, I'm going to ask for you to be in a study because I actually don't know what is best for you after six years of trading is a pretty scary moment. And what is the second scary moment? If the results come, because then the result is completely different than what you thought it would be, right? So the way to prevent these two scary moments is actually not to randomize. <laughs> An RCT is nothing else than it's a method to systematically collect, analyze, and present collective experience on medical interventions. Keywords for me are collective experience, so it's not one doctor who works for 30 or 40 years, but it's a hundred doctors who work for one year together, but you build up the same experience. And the second thing is the word 
systematically. So by designing your study, you prevent the biases and you can really learn from that. But, and it's, a, it's simple, right? So you, you create a group of homogeneous patients, you randomize them, the groups are going to be comparable and uh, uh, count the outcomes. So if I, if I explain to my family, um, my cousins and uncles and uh, aunts, and, uh, um, uh, is that how you become a professor? They said, yes. I forgot to, to, to share one thing from my CV. I come from a non-academic family. And that is a disadvantage because I don't know sometimes how to behave and I've created a couple of conflicts in my life. But it's also an advantage because I think from the perspective of the people that we serve. And that is really important to keep in mind. Don't keep it too complicated. So cohort studies in RCTs, every self-respecting city has a birth cohort, that's my field, obstetrics, and a football team. But I think we should really think about combining RCTs and cohort studies. So if we do cohort studies, then we measure everything, but there is no systematic approach, as I just explained. It is just observation. If we do an RCT, we randomize, but it's a black box, right? We give drug A and B, and then far along the line, we see if somebody is dead or not. And if there's a difference, we think, how did that happen? So what we really should do is combine assessing the mechanism from cohort studies with randomization at the same time as a, as a, as a routine. I was inspired by your talk. I was inspired by your talk for many reasons. For many reasons. Um, I thought the last part was very touching. Thank you for sharing that. But also the, the irreproducibility of research is called the valley of death, right? So people work years on a particular mechanism, develop a drug, and then they test it and it doesn't work. It's not the valley of death. It is the valley of truth, right? We researchers are trying to cross the distance from the Mediterranean Sea to green Africa, the desert, with a Toyota Corolla, and two cans of coke. And then after two days, we are surprised that we're stuck and that we're kind of die from thirst. But the reason is we go in unprepared. And the reason is that the incentives in our preclinical research are not good. So we are forced to produce these positive results. So we continue and repeat the experiment and the experiment, and we add a, another couple of mice, etc., until the mechanism works. But then we come into real life, and then it doesn't work. So I think we should not fool ourselves here. We should really improve the methods also from preclinical research. Another thing I do different, I think, if you want to solve a problem or you want to find the route or the road from the valley to the top, many of us start at the valley and find their way up, understand the mechanism, how can I influence the mechanism of disease? Test it. I start at the top. So I start at the clinical problem, and then I go back to a moment where I can make a difference. So, so what I have evaluated, and I'll show that with quite high impact papers, are all interventions that were around there already for 10, 20, 30 years. And people just had abandoned them because there was no profit margin in, because it was not sexy, etc., etc. But we should really think back from the interventions we do and evaluate from there. So I think the problems are, that there are many phrases also said this afternoon, but one issue is that you can summarize it that we underestimate the complexity of nature and we overestimate our capacity to understand it. So we should be much more humble, so to say, but if you start, and that is your goal, actually. I mean, we talk about lack of funding, but your goal is the hospital that you work in and the patients that you see every day. So if you're able to translate that into a randomized setting, then the question is actually if you need that much funding, but it is a mindset. One of the biggest mistakes that I made when I went from Amsterdam to Australia 
was that I didn't have a hospital appointment. And I'd only found out after five months. My colleague said, oh, we thought you were on sabbatical. I only had a university contract. And the reason was, I came from the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, and that is one institute. University and hospital are integrated into one. So that whole issue of two institutes doesn't even exist there. But I am raised in that setting since I went into that building as a student in 1984. So my CV is important. I am trained as an economist. Maybe I'm even a Trojan horse. So if you have a discipline different than medicine and you criticize medicine, then the doctors say, oh, you're not one of us. They cannot say that to me. But in fact, I think as an economist, and I was interested also what Connie said about solving problems, think different. I think for many problems, 99 of my colleagues go left, I go right. If they are right 75% of the time, they have to share it with 98 others. If I'm right 25% of the time, the credits go to me. So you have to take the courage to have a different approach, which is, which is not easy. I mean, medicine is a, is, a, is a conservative discipline, and people are going to uh, uh, challenge you. So a little bit, one anecdote um, um, uh, about this, uh, uh, a question in my field, uh, infertility. Um, uh, fresh or frozen transfer, we, we discussed it over the dinner table yesterday. So the story is IVF was invented in 1978, big breakthrough. Um, uh, Edwards and Steptoe, Nobel Prize, etc. Then IVF became better. Uh, so, so first it was quite inefficient, so people created three and four embryos, uh, no problem. But then it became better, so people started to get twins and triplets, and there was preterm birth and all kinds of problems. And then people started to freeze embryos. And then suddenly people realized that actually the outcomes from the frozen embryos were better than from the fresh transfers. So this is the first trial that is, that is assessing that, it is a small trial. But then I was introduced when I was into Australia in the My Duck Clinic in Ho Chi Minh City. So you would say that in terms of infertility, that not enough people is not really their problem. Uh, but there are a lot of people who, who struggle with infertility there. And I went there to the clinic, enormously organized and huge, 10,000 IVF cycles in one clinic in a year. So that is more than 50% to the capacity that I had seen in the Netherlands if everyone worked together. So I spoke to the team. Um, you can always recognize me on the group picture because I'm a bit uh, bigger than the rest. Um, uh, and we said, let's do a study fresh frozen transfer. And they, they did it. So one of the good things here is I thought about contrast, but they also didn't force them into a study that they couldn't do. So it was not yes IVF, no IVF, which would be an unfeasible study there. But fresh versus frozen was actually quite feasible. So they executed that um, within two years, and the paper was accepted in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was, was, was a great story, really. 800 women uh, uh, randomized. Uh, we didn't find uh, a significant difference. Um, 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 but, but I think it was a great success. So think about if you come, and I do that in China also. So, so similar, China has huge clinics with an enormous good organization, whether it's so democratic or not, I don't know, but in itself the potential is huge. And think about if you start with trials that you make them feasible. So think about that, for example, we talked about the difference RCTs for doctors is be careful with a no intervention arm, because that's challenging. I can't do that in the Netherlands, for example. In Australia, much more difficult. Patients are not going to accept it. Keep a simple primary endpoint, something that is already registered in your database, for example. No extra measurements. We had protocols in the Netherlands about stillbirth was a study, and then if you were a registrar and you asked someone informed consent and the, and the person said yes, then you knew that you didn't have a dinner that night because there was so much administration. So think about that. Another analysis I have done 
is how much of the data that we collect in RCTs we actually use in the publications, 30 to 40 percent. So be lean in what you try to achieve and what you ask from others. Um, another comment on RCTs is realize that, that the randomization is one part, but the fact that you, that you structure the question and follow the intention to treat principle is something that you also can generate without randomization. And that is maybe simpler. So if we compare RCTs and cohort studies, then RCTs, large RCTs, do not have bias and they have little variation. Small RCTs have a wide variation, so they're weak for that reason. And into the cohort studies, we can reduce the variation by making them bigger, but we have potentially a systematic bias. But if you think about your questions, you can actually control that. So what I've done in Vietnam also is two months one policy, two months another policy, not randomized, but in the trial registration. And it was not New England Journal of Medicine, but it was still a high impact paper. Oh yeah, that is this paper. Uh, so here we said we have a question, um, but randomization is gonna take us two years. And we said we are gonna compare two and two months. And then actually we found a 5% difference in live birth rate. So I think that that also helps you to give um, to give answers. Um, what I'm doing currently, Australia is, is difficult. Private system is huge, uh, very influential. People make a huge amount of money, which not really helps with having a, a, a nice climate. So I do a lot of individual participant data meet analysis, which means that we approach authors from all over the world and ask them to share their individual data. Um, one other thing that was touched upon also this afternoon, and I could talk another hour about it, is research integrity is a much bigger problem than we think it is. So what we find if we do this individual participant data meet analysis is that the reason that people do not share data actually is that their material is not as trustworthy as we think it is. Plus, the people who share data, you see the problems there also. So this is really an issue that should be addressed. And I think, actually, that we as an academic community should step up um, for that. I'm happy to talk um, on that later uh, today. So passion is important. If you start as a young person, don't think about the publication, but think about a question that you really want to answer. And if you do that well, with sufficient power, then the big journals are going to be interested in that answer, so to say. But don't get too much fooled by the, by the hype. I mean, what's the current hype? Uh, what is it? Artificial intelligence, right? I mean, my goodness, really. That's really, I think, it's really solving nothing, I think, at least in my field. Five years ago, it was microbiome. Everybody jumped on the microbiome. I don't know how it goes in your clinic, but I don't see any application of the microbiome until now. So don't go, and here also the argument goes, 200 people go into AI, so you're not gonna make the difference there, right? Go the other way. That is really uh, something I have to share. So if I can, a couple of, I go a little bit over time, a couple of examples of RCTs that I was involved in. This was recurrent miscarriage, heparin plus aspirin doesn't improve the outcome. Progesterone doesn't improve the outcome. This was a study on intrauterine pressure monitors. We were writing a guideline 2003, 2004, found out that the evidence to do that wasn't there. You put in a catheter while the woman is laboring. I've done it hundreds of times during my time as a registrar, and you measure the contractions. With two midwives without budget, we started to randomize, randomized 1,500 women, there was no difference in outcome. Paper, so the first two authors are two midwives who both got their PhD on it to show you how naive. So the paper was first submitted to JAMA, rejected. Then I shouted to the to Jeanette on the other side of the corridor, try New England Journal of Medicine. And while we were writing the rebuttal, she thought that the New England Journal of Medicine was in England, right? That was how naive we were at the time. But if you do good things, then the big journals accept it. Uh, studies on the induction of labor. 
Another important thing that you can see, I do multiple studies on the same topic. So one follows the other and you get better in it and your questions are uh, uh, better. Studies on tocolysis, we have done five of these uh, studies. Uh, Ricardo, an ectopic pregnancy study, uh, self-injectomy versus self-injostomy. This study took eight years with very limited function. It was a, function, was a Lancet paper. And the other thing, there is always opportunity. So I was in Melbourne. You talked about lockdown. Well, <laughs> come to Melbourne, right? Five kilometers from home, nine o'clock a.m. At, ho at, at home, night curfew, uh, one hour a day, not going to work, etc., etc. The whole society closed for a year. And I thought, what am I doing here, right, with my family? Until the neonatologist said, we don't see any preterm birth anymore. So, so this is published by Daniel Rolnick, also from Brazil, showing that in lockdown, if you give women rest, preterm birth reduces with 50%. Right? That is a huge effect. So the message here is that I think that there is always opportunity around you to see new things. But if you, if, you don't, if you don't look for that opportunity, you're not going to see it. So this was something that, and we're doing an RCT actually now, starting to mimic lockdown or give women rest to see if we can mimic this um, treatment effect. So key messages, one simple question, simple design, randomize, don't be afraid to randomize, get it in your routine. When I started as a consultant, I was with a group of 10. There was a handover. I made an extra list if the patient was in a trial or not. So if I came back Monday morning, I could see how much patients were randomized. If they had a tough weekend, very busy, baby that died, I kept my mouth shut. But if it was quiet and they had it randomized, then I kindly said to them that that needed to be uh, improved. Collaborate, think about sample size, Think from research to clinic, so don't follow the clinical data. Stay away from uh, bureaucracy and finally share and be generous. So one thing I did well, I think, I said to many people, if we had written a grant application, you can appoint a PhD student that's going to be the first author, you are going to be the last author and I'm going to be the pre-last author. Which means that I did not have to involve in all the logistics of the study and I could basically walk away to another project until the results come. So you're not going to see me that often last author, so to say. Many in the academic world do this. I do this. And I think in the end it will benefit you enormously. And it is fun. So one of the best pictures of my professional career, when I left the Netherlands, I had a picture with, I think, 120 PhD students. And everyone has an individual story. I mean, I'm so proud to share this with you and it is so valuable to sh I mean a PhD is not like like the family intimacy or a marriage but 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 you come very close to the personal life of people and that is a wonderful um, experience so the last study you talked about childhood cancer and your um, little child um, one thing of hope I think is that if one field made progression, then it's childhood cancer. And the reason is randomization. So there is an enormous improvement in that field because there is a collaborative randomization. And I think in other fields we should make that, um, uh, that same improvement. So this is my personal life. I told you that I was born in 1965. This is a study that shows, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that if you make an HSD with oil-based contrast, that you have 10% more pregnancy rates after water-based contrast. This was another uh, treatment that we evaluated um, uh, that was abandoned. Everybody is jumping to IVF. Um, my parents married in 1956. I'm the older son, and I don't have any sisters. So from that you get derived that my mother suffered nine years of infertility. And when I did this study, she actually said that she had an HSG in November 1964. 
So that is the conflict of interest, because without that HSG, I would probably not have uh, been here. So a day without randomization is a day without progress, and I'm really inspired that this topic is in your agenda. I think that's great, and I'm happy to share any thoughts um, later in the discussion or later today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ben Moll. It was very uh, thoughtful, all of the, the presentations here. We are a little bit ahead of time. We still have this workshop for those that belong to our uh, program, the professors and students. And I'd like to know if someone from the audience like to have a, a question. Please, the people from Lucas, Connie, here in the, the table, please. And Professor. Dr. Mo, I have seen, I had uh, saw in your CV, your public C, uh, curriculum vitae, uh, that you are a trialist. But very nice to meet you in person. Because you are a. a uh, as you call here in Brazil, a root uh, uh, trialist. You do believe a lot in trials no? and live for that. Uh, congratulations. No? I have the same, some way, in the other side of the world. No? Same view, and Otavio, that I cited before. Uh, that's a guy that was born to be a trialist. No? Everything uh, wants to answer with a trial. I do have an a, a objective question. We are talking about to go to the other side, but sometimes, as you cannot go uh, to another direction uh, that differently from your conceptual hypothesis. Uh, please, uh, to, do you have an idea how many times no, you go against or are, or are surprised by the results of a trial? No? Uh, because I, my, my trials, as usually, I, my conceptual hypothesis is I expected to find the results, and mostly in my, my area, I do find that uh, diuretics and blood pressure uh, and uh, treatment of uh, sleep apnea and so on. But you are saying by your speech here that you... It's a little bit for those who do trials. It's it's like, well, I was not born in 1963, but I know that pe people knew what they did when they heard when Kennedy was shot, or they heard they knew what they were doing when they heard that the twin towers were collapsing. But but from a personal view, I still recollect from the big trials when I heard the result that I didn't expect. Right? Somebody called me, and I still recall that moment, so to say. But it goes. I mean. Before we did our induction studies, that I shared that this morning, the general belief was that induction of labor increased the cesarean rate. But the opposite is true, right? It was, and, and, and when we did a study of 10 minutes bed rest uh, after intrauterine insemination, what actually maybe is, is not that surprising that you find that is better, colleagues didn't believe it. I, I will turn it around. So the amount of challenges that I had have had after I have published the trial, because the trial went against the, 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 the traditional paradigms. And I mean, maybe, I don't know, another factor might be that I, I am just, I'm just evaluating the secondhand stuff that people have thrown away. Well, it doesn't make you very popular to show that that actually works, right? We, when we did balloon inductions, which is a very simple mechanical way, and the balloon cost $1, um, uh, we went to the east of the Netherlands, and then there was an obstetrician in his uh, 60s about to retire, and he said, I'm not going to do that, because then I'm back where I started here 40 years ago, right? So, but the, 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 so the message here is that we completely forget to evaluate. We introduce without innovation, and we left things alone without innovation, really. I think that is, a, that is a big mistake. And there is another thing here that is specifically important for a public system, is the things that I talk about do not have a profit margin. So I think one of the mechanisms why they are not 
evaluated and used is nobody makes profit from it. But from a public health perspective, that is exactly the treatments that you need, right? I mean, if, and if you can help 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the population with simple means, you're left with more budget to help the other th people with more technology, so to say. I'd, I'd just like to ask uh, Professor Lucas a question about uh, non-publication. Because a lot of times, a lot of research actually does not show, for example, a treatment effect. And then there's a lot of publication bias because then people would say, well, it doesn't show an effect, therefore we're not going to publish it. And then surely then other people are going to try and prove an effect, which maybe doesn't exist, and therefore you know, you're throwing money away, trying to insist on, uh, I think that was what uh, Professor Moll was also saying, that you keep trying to repeat until you get a result that's more or less positive, you know, whereas actually, so oh, what should uh, maybe journals do to prevent uh, publication bias? Um, th thank you about this question. Um, well, uh, the publication bias is its a matter of a lot of source, uh, and perhaps it's, it, it answers that we may solve it by a lot of perspectives. Uh, the first one that is, has been applied for two or three years is the registered reports uh, way to publish. So you first submit uh, your methodology, until your methodology, and then your paper is uh, peer-reviewed and it is accepted for publication at the moment of the, m the methodology. And after this, doesn't matter the results, direction, um, the editor and the, the reviewers, uh, they don't need to do anything. Uh, just check if you don't deviate from the protocol uh, that you previously uh, submitted. So uh, important journals are doing this um, right now, PLOS Medicine, BMC Medicine, and, and others are working with the, the system of um, registered reports. The second thing, uh, but the most difficult thing, is what you talk and what you talk as well. Um, that's about the strategic plan. Um, because by the end of the day, why we do research? And for whom we do research? We need to talk about that. Because if we do research for us to, be, uh, to get funding to, um, to favor uh, our graduate programs uh, and so on, and there's no problem about that right now because the system is, is this, um, we do not pursue a, a, a true finding. Then um, we need to change the ecosystem, and that's that's a big deal. Uh, that's a big deal. So um, I have the same problem of uh, Dr. Mo. Uh, uh, perhaps I'll be kick it off in some, at some time because I talk what I think, <laughs> and then um, some places in the Netherlands, uh, for example, are changing the way um, to get funding and also uh, for tenure that we don't have here in Brazil. Um, so I think that some improvements uh, in the near future will, will, will happen, but we need to deal with this at least for f five years or so on. Oh, that's that's what I think. But in terms of publication, uh, the registered reports are being um, our first solution, and it seems to work. So, so in a, in addition, I mean, there is a short-term and a long-term problem. The short-term problem is that we all have to follow the metrics of publication, right? So we talk here this afternoon about how to get the school strategic position to get the PhD program back, etc. And you need publications for that. So, so, so that is a reality. But the long term for me is that the whole publication model doesn't work. I think that the publishers 
completely do not take their responsibility, right? They increase the number of papers where we should have a decrease, actually. We have much too much papers. The quality control is nowhere. I mean, I touched upon fabricated papers. That is 20% what is out there. I'm challenging the publishers to do something about it. They don't do it. So the solution for me is that the funders take it in their own hand and say, we are going to publish the results of your research. That, that is the, the UK that is happening, that if you get a grant from the government, Welcome the government, yeah, the, the government will, will and, and the researchers have to rush to publish their, their material in the Lancet before it's out there, because otherwise the Lancet doesn't take it. But I think for the quality of the research, it would be much better if we just say, listen, this is a well thought experiment. We're going to fund it, it's relevant. We write down the protocol to prevent, and we should do that in basic research. We do it in trials now, but we should do it in basic research also, to and potentially in genetics, etc. Yeah. To, to say, well, you, you're not going to add that other mice of three mice to get the significant result that you have. And then we, we, the, the, the funder publishes that in the public domain. What's wrong with that model? I mean, the other, there is, there is, there is these, these YouTube videos where, 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 where comedians make fun of researchers who said, well, right, you, you do everything, all the work, and then you hand it over and you lose all the copyright. Yeah. It's, a cra it's a crazy system, really. Yeah. There's a question there. Just, just some point, uh, some statistics that I know by mind. Uh, nearly 90% of what is published in the literature, what you know that is published uh, because there's something under the iceberg, 90% is positive result. Yeah. 90. That's, that's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's positive results. Is, is, is there something wrong uh, at all? Yeah. And, and second thing is that uh, for, hard, for hard science, it's is, is easier to, to, to claim for a discover. Very, very easy uh, when you find, uh, when you discover something. But in life science, no, and not at all. And, and it's, um, some, uh, some estimations from John Ioannidis, again, um, puts that nearly 20% of uh, everything that we are doing in drug development turn it into a real drug that real works. So 80% waste. That's like statistics that I know by mind. This, this last one is science, and the first one is in plus medicine. Well, I'm Marcio Shadid. Uh, I'm a surgeon uh, at Hospital of Clinicas and uh, a permanent professor at this program, Surgical Sciences. Well, there are too many things for a surgeon to endeavor in research. So first, you need to do surgery, and sometimes it's high-complexity surgery, like liver transplants that I do. And then you have to assist patients, and then sometimes you have private offices or other jobs, and then you have to teach, and then you have to do research. And then you have to manage people because you're the manager of a team. So it, it is impossible. And then you have to do basic research, six or five or six rows for, some, for one, one unique person. So it's kind of impossible. The other thing I would like to ask is... Uh, so I have an advice for you. Oh, sir. Yeah. Stop the basic research. Yes, I have done. <laughs> and then use the time to find out which half of the procedures you do actually don't work. Because I bet you that half of the procedures you do are not helping your patients. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's true. No, not I, at all. I just not at all. You replaced it with the liver. Not well, at all. <laughs> not at all. But, but not everybody, but not every. No, I'm not at all. Take, no, 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 not I'm at all. all. I, I've, just, I've just shown you that 50% of the medical interventions does not have a knowledge base, right? And that is not different in your practice. No, no, we're, do, we're talking about liver transplant. It, it's something that is worldwide uh, done. We have 85, uh, 84% one year survival. We do hernia, we do lap coals. These are things that, that are not, well worldwide done. So I disagree with you. I respect what you say, but I strongly disagree yeah. with you. And I think you're being a little bit disrespectful with surgery, I know, but that's with the, the usual, science and practice of surgery. That's the usual response, right? It's true, but it's not true for me. It's well, true for I all of us. I respect what you say, but and then I would like to shift to some other thing because this is a discussion I that. I don't mind. Listen, I just gave you an advice, right? 
So that that do with his what you want. I don't mind. I'll do uh, what I, I'll keep doing what I do nowadays. Uh, basic research is something that I don't do because of the several roles. I would like to point something different. Uh, the things with sciences, it's uh, I review for I have reviewed for six, uh, 56 uh, indexed journals. I'm an editor of five or associate editor of five indexed uh, journals. Um, but I strongly disagree but with the way that science is being done worldwide. The journals sometimes are interested in money. They want like $2,000 for an accepted paper. $2,000, oh my God, sometimes more. And then, yeah, it's just uh, no way. So it's, uh, the other thing is they don't pay us as editors and reviewers. So it's just like, I mean, there's no, no sense. And, you know, I, I prefer uh, publishing journals that don't uh, charge as much, that much at least. So I would like to uh, listen to your opinion. Yeah, okay. Uh, two things. One thing, we have started now replying for those journals that you have to pay a fortune to. And I'll send an, an email saying, okay, you want me to give my, the co my hourly cost is such and such, normally around about $400. So if you want my, 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 my advice on this paper, then, if, then that this is what is going to charge you since you're, you're charging for, to publish, and this is my charge. I'm not giving to giving any more free uh, opinions. I'm actually a, a, also an editor for a couple of international journals. And I tried to get out of it because I said it wasn't worth my time. And they, oh, please, 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 please stay. But I thought, pay me more, you know? <laughs> why can't wait? Why can't they? If, if, if other people. The other thing that I would say is that um, a lot of this pressure to publish, publish or perish, it does come from us. It comes from within the system. It comes from the CAPS evaluation. And one of the things that we have been trying to push for recently, did you know that 75% of what is produced by the postgraduate courses is not publications? 75% are other products, such as technologies, such as apps, such as uh, didactic materials, such as this and that and the other thing, that which is, and what is produced, for example, papers. There are 12 points that are evaluated. This is another talk. <laughs> There's 12 points that are evaluated, and those, within those 12 points, the same indicators appear in all 12 points. For example, 50% of the evaluation is procedure. It is not where you want to go, which is what I said. Publication is about another 10, 15% of the evaluation, and it appears in the quality of the, the student, the quality of the docenti, the quality of this, the quality of that, the quality of the other thing. It's the same thing. You measure the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. So one of the things I think that needs to be done is that the courses and the areas have to sit down and say, what do we need to be evaluated on? And the other thing is that not everybody has to be evaluated the same to be considered as excellent. So what we have is that if I'm in Amazonas or if I'm in Grande Sul, I have the same evaluation. This should, the, the, the different courses should start to complain and say, listen, my impact is regional. My impact is in basic science. My impact is in technology production. Therefore, I have no reason to be evaluated on this and that and the other thing. And if they're asking you to do strategic planning, then your strategic planning, one of the things is included in strategic planning are your goals. And then you do all of this strategic planning, which you're going to do, all of these goals, and then you're going to be evaluated in something totally different. What's the sense in that? Absolutely none. Uh, if uh, if my last one, Flavio, uh, you know Doug Altman, Douglas Altman. Do Douglas Altman. Douglas Altman. It's a red okay. diet. It's a red diet. Uh, it's <laughs> easy, but it's. Uh, worldwide known statistician and epidemiologist. He has a quote uh, that is uh, uh, the difference between medicine and agronomic research is that the 
last one is not done by farmers. So if you don't talk to me that uh, you are an editor reviewer and from a graduate program, I would say to you, stop to do research. Because there is a lot of in your, um, in your, in your table to handle, um, to do research. But you are handling, uh, OK, so, but for a different one, I, I would say, OK, stop to do research. And that's a problem worldwide. Worldwide, that's n n no problem with this. And about the the fees, uh, the, the journals, and I can tell you better because the the OAJ and I'm an editor of the the OAJ. It's a mix between. Um, it's an open access, so at the time that you don't retain the copyright, you won't um, have the profit to make the journal running. That's fair. That's the fair part of the thing. That's the unfair part of the thing. Like the business that the journals factory turn it on nowadays. Because it holds your carrot to progress and proceed in your career. Uh, just, just to, you had, a, you had a discussion here, but you, we were talking about the same thing. No? We were, it does uh, the liver transplant, okay? The, the, there is no, no other option to, to go to the other side, okay? To replace or not to replace a, a, a liver the full failure, okay? Now, this is not the, this is the point, <laughs> this is the main point. They are doing that without uh, clinical trials, okay? Because the, the liver transplants and heart transplants and so on are, do are being done daily in my service also, uh, the heart transplants. But there is a, 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 a many questions surrounding, surrounding the proce procedure. No? Do this way, prepare the liver of that way, okay? The time of to, 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 to do something. Uh, there is uh, the, the, your suggestion is. Uh, no, no, but I'm I, sure I, I that wanna, my colleague here agree. Uh, with listen, that. I wanna, I, you're defending your colleague. I see that. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate I'm defending, that. I'm defending. But I want to get this, this straight, uh, right? <laughs> you you asked me for advice, right? I, yeah, yeah, you said I'm too busy. What should I do? That's what you said, yeah. right? No, or not? I'm saying that it's impossible to handle basic research. We have a well, we agree on that. Stop basic research. That, no. because, that but, uh, but I, but I, even without randomized clinical trials, I think you can look. You is impossible for us as well. That is what we everybody. Pr clinical practice, we do uh, okay. clear cut uh, science. Interest. Yeah, I, I challenge you. It's good. I, I, it's good. I mean, we. we I, I, I certainly, I certainly touch something within you, which is a good thing. Um, but I would say there is also the opportunity to do prognostic research. Yeah. See in whom. Yeah. That's what the, we do. The, well, but then I think you should be able to to guide your, your practice and do the procedures in, in the people who really have a long survival. Yes, that's what we but but in, the, in the end, I mean, I don't know who showed it, but there was, there was the slide of, of ignorance versus teaching. That is the story here, right? I mean, we can go on with uninformed medicine. And, and, and I see the same with obstetrics, right? Uh -huh. in, with COVID. In, in Australia, I mean, you talked about the COVID. Well, come to Australia, right? I mean, you're, phew, I mean, Brazil was, was not optimal also. We know that, and I should be careful here. But, but really, how all the procedures are. So everybody is completely over, overworked. And if everybody is a COVID exposure, then you have to be at home, etc. So the registrars who still work are kind of falling. falling. So it's the same as in obstetrics. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. But our way out is research. Our way out is knowing what works and what doesn't. And, and, and I think we do not know, and I should be careful, I'm going to be humble here because I have never done a liver transplant. Um, um, but, but, but I think there is really room for improvement in the system. And the other thing here is we can, get, we can do meaningful things here without a lot of funding, right? Th that is my other message. The gold is in our hands. Every, every morning on the handover, there, there was this opportunity to guide clinical practice with research. And if you do that, then you are successful. I've shown that. 
Just, just a small, uh, a small question. Uh, you talk uh, about the cooperative uh, meta-analysis with individual data. We are having a experience now with people around the, 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 the world, uh, led by Italians. 20% uh, of the people did not send their data. They did not answer, the, even the answer. And other that sent the data, <laughs> the reanalysis of the data where the results are different from what was published. I, I think that the wrongdoings in these areas as well. <laughs> I, I touched upon <laughs> that much. problem. Cochrane has a problem. Conventional meta-analysis has a problem. We should, we should really work on that, right? Yeah. I think it was a very <laughs> heated heated debate and it was nice. I think it's good because he started to think and uh, he said things to me yesterday that really th make me think what I'm doing you know, because it's important for us to have an open mind as a scientist. And I, we're going to have now a workshop a little bit late in, the, in our schedule, but I thank you very much for everybody. For those that were assigned for the workshop, it's going to be in the next room, and then from now we're going to be in Portuguese. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you and I are not using masks. No? <laughs> <laughs>